Hey everyone! Thank you so much for waiting around. Just had to grab myself a coffee. Been a little bit later than usual, but hey, we're here. How's everyone doing? Turn the volume a little bit down as well. George is here! Damian is here! Man is doing great. That's awesome. Happy to have you here. Let me just boot up uh, Unreal as well. So I can give everyone an overview of what I did behind the streams. How are you doing, George? Doing good? Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, I've been doing good myself as well. I've been uh, I've been actually getting really organized behind the scenes on the scene, which was uh, really necessary. I've also been doing like some texture tweaks as well. Uh, so yeah, did some changes, tweaking some of the textures. I think last time we've already kind of talked about the pottery, right? Let me let me switch it up as well. So I did some tweaks on the pottery, uh, which is down here. Got some pottery here as well, just to showcase like the different variations that I'm building. Those are just like different shaders, right? So it's literally just like a different material instance that I apply on it. Which is super neat. I did some tweaks to like some of these chests as well. And that's also what we're going to be continuing to do today as well, is um, we're going to we're going to just uh yeah just polish some some assets you know i've made this kind of thing where it's it's basically trying to simulate because i've it's basically trying to simulate how it works in studios as well where you kind of it's kind of like jira you know like where you keep track of like all the assets that you're building on i'm just doing it inside of my molding program um so these are the ones that are done so these are the ones that we kind of worked on before. There's some plates in there. And then this is the stuff that still needs like a bit of polish. Ranging from simple, simple material tweaks to, yeah, to, to still like a lot of work that needs to be done to like really refine on it. And then this is more like a, a testing zone. So this is like a, a new system that I'm going to try out. Yeah. That's what I'm going to be doing today. Just uh, continue working on some assets, doing some polishing. It's going to be a nice, relaxed stream. And hopefully, hopefully we're, we can push it to the next level, you know? Because I think on some assets, like this chest over here, I think the amount of detail that's on there and like how it's starting to look feels really nice. So we're just going to continue on that. As always, for the people that are here, feel free to ask any questions. If you have any topic that you want to bring up, feel free to bring it up. I love a good discussion. So, yeah. Feel free to shout out some topics if you have them. And let's get started, shall we? I think I want to have a look at this one, even though it's in here. I noticed that there were still some issues with like the, the map itself. Just tweak that.
So with this one, the issues the issues are that the mesh normals, like you can kind of see that I didn't mark like a lot of stuff as sharp, which is creating like this weird kind of blobby looking stuff on the mesh. So we're actually going to sharpen that all up and make sure that the normals are nice and even on on the major parts of the mesh. that's one thing that I didn't pay a lot of attention to before so paying for that now really like a quicker way to do this would also to just be like select sharp edges and then see we're missing some stuff and then we can just tell that to be sharp as well George is enjoying some coffee that's awesome I just made a cup of it myself I just need to remember to drink it I'm so bad with that That's fine. This area is still a little weird. What's actually happening here? Yeah, it's better. This doesn't need to be sharp. This doesn't need to be sharp either. Yeah, it's looking way better. And I gotta make sure to exploit it as well. George, are the assets turned on as Nanite in Unreal? No, I'm not using Nanite for this project. That's a good question, though. I'm still doing it the old school way. Where it's just simple topology. What's this called? Workbench. So what I'm, you'll probably see, you'll probably see the issue, like if I'm, I'm going to re-export this. Or like re-import it. Let's clean up some of the normals. Old but gold way, exactly. Yeah, also, I'm trying to make it as versatile as possible, right? Because it's easy... It's easy to turn a non-nanite mesh into nanite because it's just a tick box, right? But if you still make them in a way where they're, they're still good low polys, you can technically have it without nanite. Right, so trying to be as versatile as possible when it comes to that. Okay. I'm just gonna go through the next asset. I think I was working on these barrels before, so... Let's continue those. What I'm also doing is, like, I'm trying to do, like, all the details as well. Like, I'll, I'll add, like... I'll add, like, little tweaks to the model, right? Like, just making it a little bit more unique. Especially because we have the geometry anyway. Might as well like use it to make it a little bit less uniform and just I'm trying to get get away from that sterile like 3D look that you can sometimes see what I'm trying to get away from and what I actually loved doing uh, let's have a look soft selection for the win what I actually love doing is we if we select this edge, then bevel it. Then remove all this stuff. And then we close it back up. We can actually create some some like interesting 
like shape breakup where you could you could kind of see that it's not just like a straight plank, right? Like I want some character in here, so let's make sure that we add it. It's gonna be sharp. It's gonna be sharp in the seam. Doesn't need to be a seam. So yeah, with this project, I'm trying to be as versatile as, pro as uh, possible. Trying to keep everything like really optimized while keeping it like. While keeping it modular. Right? Modular in the sense of you don't need to use Nanite for this to work. Uh, this doesn't have any backing to it, so maybe... Let's see. Move it a little bit down. Yeah, again, for people just joining, feel free to ask any questions can be about your personal work, uh, industry topics. Feel free to shout anything out. Make sure that nothing goes wrong here. Just move that to the side. Right, so now we're adding some interesting character to it. It's not just like a rounded tub, you know. And this is not even adding too many additional pieces of geometry. Right, This is mainly using what was already there. So you can do a lot with that. Um, nah, you're not going to see that. doesn't matter. Good morning, Rod. How is it going? And I'll do... Oh. Some stuff got screwed up in the UVs. See, that's why I hate the stacking thing. That's probably why it caused it. Let me see if I can go back to it. I don't think I can. Too far gone. So annoying. Oh, it's not the stacking thing, so maybe it was there before. No. See. Oh, maybe I just didn't clean it up last time. That could also be it. Up this thing here. What I'm trying to do is like all these shells here. I basically want to keep them as like singular planks. Like where there's no seam, I want to keep them like as a singular thing. Squish it down. I'll just have to go through it, like all of this stuff. Got some skewing here. This is just easy enough. We'll see. Apart from the normals here, I think we're good. Like an interesting issue happening here. Hmm. 
technically just reset them, right? Sometimes, I don't know, sometimes Blender is just weird with like how it treats normals and sometimes it just doesn't know what to do with them, I guess. Beard. Okay, that's cleaned up. Looking nice. And we can also just like re import that as well. What is everyone else working on? Doing anything cool? Oh, also. I made a promise that we were going to talk about a topic today, but I completely forgot what the topic was. I didn't write it down. <laughs> Does anyone else know what the topic was from last week? Because last week we, we talked a little bit about AI and like its potential impact on us, right? Um, and I think... I think last time someone brought up that they wanted to talk about like getting into the industry, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, Damian, you're a level designer. That's awesome. Where do you work, if I may ask? Okay, any issues? I think so. Oh, the only issue that we, that we need to do here... Well, the only thing need to do is just reapply our vertex colors right because we added some geo so it's gonna, gonna forget about that uh second channel ao please oh interesting this is also something i'll need to solve then <laughs> studio in croatia on the games come that name rings a bell. That name rings a bell. I think I looked at it before, but I can't... Oh, I can't remember it. Nice, though. Awesome to have some LDs in here as well. Um, How do we want to do this? Because I basically need vertices that are not obscured by the rest of the mesh. So what I can potentially do is just do this. Right, so that, that gives us some vertices that we can play with. Um... Let me connect up some stuff here as well. Because this geo is like a little bit screwed up. Join that up. Then if we add one here, we get some vertices in the middle as well. Maybe... This is really messy though. Yeah, because we're getting, we're getting a lot of geo here. Okay, let me... Not a good approach. And of course, I can't go back. I'm looking for a more elegant solution here. No, not at the cursor. 
George is sculpting a wood for your next project, a coffee bean grinder. Oh, hell yeah. That's awesome. That's why you're drinking coffee, right? It's all a part of the research. Let's have a look. So this, this side is fine, actually. I gotta, I gotta keep my feel in mind as well. Oh, the outer edges are f <sighs> screwed up anyway. Okay, let's uh, let's steal this one over here. What I could, what I'm currently thinking is, so this is, that's two-sided, right? Are they connected at all? Yeah, they are. Okay, so, Because I could not scale them up and not have them obscured for the vertex. For the vertices. This is all just an attempt to get like the additional texturing layers that I'm adding in the material to work out. Right? Because I need some vertices, because vertices basically means um a tighter transition between the textures right? because I'm using my vertex color as a mask to drive it all so that's why I'm trying to get like a, a more uniform layout of all of this but let's see what that translates to in this case right yeah so we're not getting full black anymore we still have some stuff going on but I don't think that's that big of an issue. Interesting that we get. White stuff going in. Yeah. Might need to tweak that in the material actually. Where you have. Because this is. This is where the AO doesn't go right so i technically don't want that i want the dirt to also populate inside of inside of the crevices as well so let's have a quick look if we can we can tweak that up a little bit oh that's the moss let's not do that Hmm. Yeah, this is interesting. I'll need to do some tweaking because now it's cutting out all the crevices if I use like my normal map to influence it. I basically need to invert that. Because you want a more emphasis on like the crevices and then it to take over the rest of it. So I'll need to tweak that later on. Now this is workable though. So you technically want something a bit more that. Huh. Interesting. That means I'll just need to play around with it a little bit more. 
Let's keep it like this so I remember. But yeah, the, the vertices are good. We got some good density going on. I think this is prop done. Let's see, let's continue with this series. This has a weird name, so that's not being used currently. Up number two. Sculpting wood is quite fun though. Like I had a little bit of fun on it in the beginning of this project. So uh enjoy, George. This is the same thing here that we did before, right? So we're just gonna bevel this a little bit. And then we're gonna Move this stuff down so that we get like a crack between the two. And we just need to close that up again. And then we can do stuff like this. A little wonkiness in it as well. George, I've heard geometry is more performant than using an alpha mask, but if a fence is going to have a crazy amount of polygons, then it's probably better to use alpha in this case, right? Yeah, in that case, yes. Because what people are talking about is... <laughs> there's, there's multiple spectrums on what it means to be more performant, right? Because what a lot of people talk about is... Or what I think they talk about is like the size on disk, right? Where you look at the actual size that is needed to like load in textures compared to geometry. Uh, in that case, textures are like way more expensive, right? Because like, let's say some of my textures take up like 44 megabytes. Whereas like an asset... I don't know. Let's, let's have a look at an asset here, right? So let's see. Uh, yeah. 0.03 megabytes compared to 44 megabytes, right? So that's one thing. And that also makes it quicker to load up, right? Because it all needs to be loaded up in memory as well. Um, whereas an alpha mask, if you're going for like a larger size, then yeah, it's gonna it's gonna take up longer to load as well, comparatively. However, in in like a fence situation, yeah, it's probably the fence is also is also interesting because you're using the opacity. Right? And with opacity you always have to be kind of careful because you're you're basically rendering like pixels twice, right? Spoiler alert, I'm not a technical artist, so this is gonna be like a dumbed down version of what it actually is. What that means is that if you're using an opacity mask, it's going to render the, the pixels on the opacity mask and also all the pixels behind it. So it's doing double the work, right? If you use like a large opacity mask or an alpha mask, then that means, especially if you have them stacking, the, the price of that becomes exponential, right? So you got to be careful with it that way. Um, but yeah, purely comparing geometry and... Uh, Texture in this case. Yeah, just use a texture for that. For sure. I'm actually curious, like with Nanite, that's also another another thing to keep in mind, right? With Nanite, it would actually be an interesting interesting case to look at like what they use there because they have fences in fortnite right but i think they still use alpha masks or like opacity masks for them but i'm not sure oh the underside of this is not mapped yet i've not played that much fortnite to do like the research so got no idea if anyone knows 
happy to share it in the chat if it use if Fortnite uh, fences use an opacity mask compared to like pure geometry. I think it's an opacity mask. Okay. Just quickly unwrap this. Make sure that I'm not screwing anything else up when I do so. Let me just scale that. Move it there. Thanks for explaining, Tim, the future tech artist. <laughs> oh my god. Tech art is like its own beast, you know? Like, knowing, knowing all the ins and outs and like different situational uh, comparisons. Right, because that's usually what it boils down to, is that you have to be able to look at the situation and then tell artists like myself, just like, oh, this is the most optimized way of doing it. That's how we're doing it. From like a tech perspective, right? And then obviously there's there's a healthy there's a healthy uh push and pull in that relation too, where a tech artist can be like, Hey, look, uh for optimization's sake, you should be doing this. Um, but then an artist can push back like, hey, look, if you want to make it look good, we can't do that because that's not going to be, that's not going to be the best option there. You know? So yeah, that makes it interesting. It's always like a, a push and pull between, honestly, all disciplines, you know? Like whenever there's crossover, there's always a push and pull. Which also makes game this incredible creative endeavor where yeah it's not just one person creating things like especially in the big companies so so many pieces of information that are being exchanged like on a daily basis voting tunnels oh my god george I've watched, uh, talking about that, we've, we've watched Infinity War, like, the, the first time. And, uh, yeah, it made me realize why I don't watch those movies, you know? Just, the visual spectacle is nice, but damn, ugh, just, yeah, movies are not for me, man, especially those ones. Mmm... So wait, let's let's get this in before I forget, right? Uh, it's looking nice. Get it in there. This is tub number two that we're working on. Oh yeah, whenever you see me do this, that's because my SSD crashed like a while ago. And I'm still... I still need to relink like a lot of the meshes that I made before. Yeah. Welcome everyone. The, the people that are new here. Feel free to drop in, say hi, and ask any questions if you have them. Would love to to talk about them. I'm currently I'm currently for the for the people that are new here, like I'm currently just doing a polish pass on like most of the assets that I've that I've made for the scene already. So what I'm basically doing is I'm trying to get rid of like these boring looking straight sections on most of the assets and just, yeah, tweaking it as much as possible. Making it look good. There's actually one thing I want to check, like on these plates, what do the normals look like? Because I feel, I feel like I've got some weird stuff going on here. Let's uh, do weighted normals, but keep sharp. Oh, there we go. Okay, that's why they look kind of weird. Oh, let's... Yeah, that's going to look way better. Oh, apart from these ones. Fix, fix some of that. Let's 
Okay. Because sometimes you get to feel like you can kind of see it in the lighting here, right? Where where it's kind of curving in like a weird way. It's kind of bending the light in a weird way. It doesn't look natural. Where you have this like off looking um, specular highlight. That seems to be coming from like, I don't know, up top. But it shouldn't be because uh, the, the face normals don't point that way. So we'll, uh, I'm just going to re-import like all of this stuff. Hi, Origin Gaming! That's so much for following. Or like subscribing. Sorry, I'm still used to Twitch. My Twitch brain just taking over. Oh yeah, that's looking way better. Like, now we get some sharp detail. Yeah. Even way better. It's more defined now. Nice. That's what I didn't really pay attention to before. So... I'll have to pay more attention to it now, now that we're doing the polish pass. Uh, barrel broken. Put this over. This is using solidify. Style to keep sharp. That's looking nice, apart from all of this stuff. Those things we want sharp. Hey, Coffee Diction! How are you going? How are you going? Yeah, I'm not even going to try to correct that. <laughs> Welcome back. Good to see you here. Oh, but it's also it's also solidifying this stuff, right? So we don't necessarily want that. So what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna split all this stuff off. Make sure that this is not being solidified anymore. Then we'll just have to bridge all this stuff up. it up yeah auto smooth nice and then on this one we'll apply the solidify and then just combine the two again the heels are still good Okay, so we'll need to we'll need to unwrap some of this stuff here. Because that seems to be broken again. Oh, let's actually do this thing first. Sharp edges. Mark all of that as a C. The unwrapping of this is so quick. I love it. The only thing that I just need to keep in mind is this annoying thing that just keeps happening. Where we'll just like randomly scatter some of my stuff. Fucking annoying! Okay, we'll just map that onto this little island here. We'll squeeze it a little bit. Scale it a little bit up. All the nice edges on there. Right, and then technically what we could do is... Potentially grab like a couple of them. Move them up. 
Let me get like a bit of variation in there. Going forward for sure. Thanks about the advice not to design too much after all. Generally, sci-fi feels way harder as a beginner. Oh, yeah, 100%. Like, that's what I was explaining last time, right? Like, uh, I'm, I have experience, right? Like, I have professional experience. Um, but even me trying to tackle, like, the design part, it's, like, a skill set that I don't have, even though with all my professional experience, right? So, yeah, it's it's super rough. And this also doesn't really only apply to sci-fi. In the beginning, working without a concept and trying to build something new, you don't have all the skills you need to make it into something that is believable and makes sense, right? I think sci-fi might be... I don't want to call it trickier, you know, it's just like a different, a different challenge where it's leaning so much into like the design spectrum that it's, it's not really that forgivable anymore. That makes sense. Like you gotta be precise with sci-fi design. Like let's say with medieval stuff, right? If you wanted to like redesign it, you, you can, there's more leeway to make mistakes there. I feel. Hey, Admiral Nightbar. How's it going, buddy? We still haven't talked as of this point. I was about to do it. But then... <laughs> oh, we just need to get to it, man. I think this week has been uh, really busy, actually. We've done... We've done, like, a bunch of meetings for the team challenge. So the team challenge that's currently rounding off, those have been happening, and we're we're kind of yeah we're kind of putting like the final touches on like another thing that we want to do with the uh, uh, with the collaboration stuff where it's basically quote unquote beyond extend studios right where we'll get people to to help us build like a world that we can then turn into like an asset pack which is gonna be. Freaking exciting. So the final touches have been made on that. So that's going to be out soon. And then I just had to catch up on like all the stuff that I basically left. Left unattended because I was focusing on all the other stuff, you know. Catching up on like the, the PDF. The compilation that I put out and then the weekly tips. So yeah, been a little busy. And fun though. So this is still fine. The underside is also fine. You doing good, Mac Bar? That's awesome, man. Uh, yeah, as I said before, I'm doing busy. Uh, and that is a good thing, right? It's not. It's not to complain about it. Oh, it's actually. We have some stuff going on here, right? So if we, if we do like a couple of tweaks, we can kind of make this look a little bit more interesting where we have a couple of open gaps here and there. Let's just quickly do that. And maybe what we'll do is we'll take soft select, push this a bit down. Yeah, and then maybe do the same thing for some of these stuff. These things too. That it looks like really broken. Yep. It's nice. Way better than before. Let's have a quick look at the normals. Normals are looking good. Is a barrel broken? Or broken zero one. 
Oh. Oh, yeah, because we revealed, like, the sides. Like, some of them will definitely have UV, UV issues. Let's... Let's fix those up really quick. Nice one. Yeah, it's been good. Cover Dixon saying... Things have to be referenced in the real world too, else people won't know what all those shapes are. Yeah, there is a there is sort of a rule when it comes to that. You want to you want to have 80% believability and 20% of like what's the word for it? Like new stuff, basically, right? Um because then the new stuff is gonna be rooted in that believability where stuff can like people can still relate to it. Um, of course, like, there's, there's stuff that's going to be deviated from it. Um, but, yeah, like, generally, like, that's, that's how movies and games, like, tend to operate. Where they have, like, this core of believability that then gets padded up with, like, genuine new stuff. Which is, uh, pretty interesting. Just make it relatable to people, right? It could actually be an interesting discussion if that is actually restricting the creativity of games. But I think what you're going to find is that some games go so far out of the originality spectrum that they become unrelatable and people just have no genuine interest in it. I don't think... I don't have a good example, though. That would be actually interesting to look into. Does anyone here have, like, a... Have, like... An example of a game that you just couldn't relate to, so you stopped playing it? I'm trying to think. And it could also not be like purely aesthetic too. Never yeah, I've never never talked about uh, well, never thought about it like that. Or in depth, at least. I knew that the rule was there and I was kind of applying it, right? Um, but, yeah. Never thought about it, like, specifically. Uh, yeah, these are the unwraps that I need to fix. Let's just quickly do that. There's some skewing up here as well that I need to fix. I spoke a lot with Eric and Naud. Uh, so, for context, like Eric and Naud were uh, or are concept artists that we worked with at um, at Ubisoft Berlin. Just to give some context there about Horizon Zero Dawn's designs, and the robots were so cool and had strong silhouettes, but then they stacked detail and detail on detail, and it made it worse, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, I see what you're saying. It's like the silhouette was very defined because that's what you want. You want you have like a clear silhouette so that's recognizable from a distance, right? Um, it's actually an interesting point. Then they fill up like the core of it with like all details that might be unnecessary. Maybe that would actually be interesting. Like, uh. Someone that I went to school with, like someone from my class, basically. Um, oh yeah, good point. They both worked at Gorilla before as well. Um, someone that I went to class with is now uh, a senior, senior asset artist. Senior technical asset artist, I think, is his official title. Sorry, Tom, if I completely butchered that. If you're listening to this, um, it would actually be interesting to talk to him about that. Because, yeah. I do see the point, though. That's also that's also leaning into uh, rest versus detail that I talk about a lot when I give feedback or, like, portfolio critiques or whatever, right? Is that not everything needs to be, like, super noisy. Like, you're always thinking about it in contrast, Right? So the way that you have to think about it is if you want to make something look really noisy, you don't, or like purposely, purposely detailed, let's call it that, not saying noisy. 
if you want to make it perfectly detailed, you have to apply it in certain areas rather than the whole thing. Because if you do it on the whole thing, that becomes noisy and not purposely detailed. Yeah, it's a very, very interesting stuff. Yeah, I think, honestly, like, I tend to, when it comes to that stuff, I tend to relate, like, a lot of it to the core foundations of art, right? Like, the artistic foundations. And to me, I lump that into, like, the contrast bracket, where you don't want everything to be, like, yeah, just detailed. Because you, you're, you're constantly, especially in games, you're trying to lead people... Uh, with the eye, right? Either it can be like in a very, in a very story-driven or like narratively driven way, but it can also be just to make a prop look very interesting. It doesn't necessarily have to like serve a purpose. It can also just because because it looks cool, right? But you still have to do it in a way where it, where it makes sense. Hi, Dimitro. Welcome to the chat, and yeah, first time watching. Happy to have you here. You have a question. Do prop artists make big assets like houses, or environment artists do it themselves? Yeah, um, that's a very good question. So, if there are a lot of houses, I'm trying to generalize here, right? Like, if there are a lot of houses, let's say GTA, they will probably have a dedicated role for people that do houses. Um... If not, if if they have just one house that that is just a part of, I don't know, like the game that they're making, then it will probably be just an environment artist or a prop artist or basically who, yeah, who comes closest with the with the skills that they need, right? Because you can also look at it in a way of. There's multiple ways of making a house, right? If you want to have... I'm thinking about Resident Evil now. If you want to have it, like, super detailed uh, and really unique, then it might lean more into the prop artist side of things. But if you want to have something that's a bit more optimized and can potentially be modularized and, like, built in, like, a reusable way, you'll probably want to talk to an environment artist itself, right? But yeah, most most companies they do have dedicated roles for that. If if they have a lot of uh, if they have a lot of buildings that they make. Yeah, that's probably the way that I would look at it. Is if they don't have a dedicated role for it, they're probably gonna find the people that are like most closely aligned to to what they think is a person that's going to be the best for the job, right? Okay, so I think... Quick look. Most of this stuff sorted out. Wait, don't I have? Yeah, let's do that. Final tweak here. Well, potentially. But yeah, like like George is saying as well, it depends on the studio, right? Like it kind of goes all over the place. It's hard to define because it depends on the studio. But I think I think a better way to look at it, it depends on the game. With my explanation. That's like the short version of it. Um My friend works at a studio as an environment artist and he mostly does uh, set dressing and places props from someone else that I made. Yeah, on open worlds, that's what I did too. Most most of my job before was placing assets. And it's it's placing assets, but also telling stories and like building locations in a way where they convey a story and like feel logical, right? It's not just like throwing assets. It goes a little bit deeper than that. Um, it's very common in game studios that build open worlds. 
I will say. Oh, my bar is saying uh, the project that he's on is mostly level art, but with the odd bit of asset creation as well. Yeah. Like when... Um, it's kind of hard, right? I can't, I can't dive into specifics too much. Good old NDA. Coffee Diction, do an environment art just by using a ready library. Hell yeah, that's fun. Yeah, I totally agree. But the big caveat there is that it's also going to be easy to replace. I want to I wanna emphasize that. Like, that stuff is going to be relatively easy to replace. And it's also, you're not showing versatility, right? That's why um, this is the, the recommendation. Uh, that's the recommendation that I give to people that are trying to get into the industry and really love that stuff. It's not just about the level art. It's about um, it's about the level art and also showing that you can make the props inside of the level art itself. Because what that's going to do is, oh, let's say the, the level is like 50% built um, and the art direction is kind of happy with the current state, but there's like a level that needs like a whole lot of prop work. They can put you on it as well. It makes you more versatile, right? And I think, I think, I don't know this for sure. But I think it is really hard to get hired as a person who only does level art. If they don't know how to create a prop. <laughs> yeah, I can't, I can't see them getting hired, honestly. That's my opinion. I might be wrong, right? But that's that's what I will say. Yeah, it really depends on on the project, like Admiral Magbar is saying too, for sure. Other projects in my studio are doing a lot of asset stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What I. Only if you're doing, if you're doing like level design route, but that goes in a different direction. Um, not sure what you mean by that, honestly. Wait, so I've seen. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's fair. Like, if you wanted to go full level design. But then, then you're tacking on like another skill set where you still need to think about like um, players' expectations and how to affect mood and like all that kind of stuff, right? Because that's or like, yeah, in what we've seen, right? Like how to set up like uh, a level for AI mesh generation for like the navigation mesh that's going to be used by by all the AI running around the level, uh, making sure that the level plays correctly. Um, you're deviating away from the art, like you said. Okay, let's, uh, let's make sure. Let's check this in the engine real quick. Oh, I need to be important still, I think. Yeah, nice. Okay, so that's fixed as well. Thanks for not just answering, it depends. Yeah, I tend to give that answer a lot, but I try to follow it up with an explanation because honestly, I think I think a lot of it does depend on like so many factors. And it's hard to track it down because there's so many factors that we're working it, like the type of studio, the type of workflow, the type of game, you know, like all that stuff has like major influences. Yeah. I hope that I that I give like a better explanation than just it depends and then nothing. <laughs> It usually, I gotta say, it usually doesn't make it easier, though. Because I think effective advice should be, like, concise and relatively easy to follow. And I feel like the advice, well, the quote-unquote advice that I'm giving here is usually quite the opposite of that, you know? Uh, copy diction, you were saying before, yet another thing are the proportions, like, know if you model out of the imagination or memory instead of references. 
things are quite the same. Maybe look too thick or an inconsistent. Yeah, honestly, no matter how good you think your uh, visual library is up here, like, you will always need references. Just to make sure. Unless, unless you're doing something so focused that you've seen so much of it that you're basically an expert on the topic, right? So let's say, let's say I would be doing like only medieval stuff for like the next 10 to 15 years. Then you become an expert at the, at the source file, um, at the, at the source file, but at, at like looking at the, the references and like really, really going into, uh, source material. That's the word I'm looking for. And then baby, yeah. Could be legitimate to call yourself uh or to only use your internal library right but usually that just doesn't happen like game dev Wait, let me actually remove this. Let me add the other one. And then we're good to go. Oh, I think I'm working with like a second UV set or something. Yeah. Maybe a weird question to ask, but why games on release very often are very unoptimized and take weeks after release to get patched? Uh, the simple answer, what um, what Magbar is saying, the simple answer is the games are too big and demanded too quickly. Even if you think you have time, things are always uh, things always change during development. Yep. Um, I think I think like a good thing is to actually reflect on how how you are making uh, projects yourself. Let's say you start a project, right? You you kind of have like your goal sort of figured out. Then try to try to put that in like a timesheet yourself, right? Like how long does it, is it going to take you to finish this uh, this environment, for example? I think a lot of a lot of people will like really underestimate and like fail to estimate like how much time it will take and it doesn't even suffer from the complexity of having to work with other people right so now scale this up by not just one person working on like a single environment by himself which is quote unquote easy to do because you have all the control but now scale this up to like hundreds or thousands of people like trying to collaborate and make a creative product together right it's it's crazy and then add on top of that like all the stuff that Mike Barr is saying where the games are usually overscoped as well or like not overscoped but like ambitious right because you want to put something out there that is pretty ambitious um which usually tends to be quite in line with like being overscoped as well right not gonna lie there um, but you usually find those things out like during the development and like maybe even after after the announcement already came out. I think you'd be surprised how much stuff gets cut or like changed. Like, uh, yeah. Like, it's really different to what um, what the eventual thing might be. It's a good question though. I think I think some of that stuff doesn't get talked about like a lot. So I think there's definitely value in talking about it. So definitely thank you for the questions. One person saying how much they need to finish an environment is very hard. Uh, especially if the skills are missing. 
Yeah, and we're yeah, we're not even talking about the skills that are missing, right? Like let's say that you have all the skills to make it work. Even then doing estimations is really tricky. Because you don't want to be doing something that another company has already done before, technically, right? You always want to improve on it or like go something more ambitious. Which usually means that you're diving into stuff that hasn't really been done. That hasn't really been done before, right? So that means that you're trying to give it your best shot and like estimating it, but you're probably going to be off. Yeah. Very interesting. And yeah, then, uh, yeah, add the financial pressure on top of that and like scheduling it for like a specific financial year or even for like a specific uh, show, right? Like, yeah. Complexity upon complexity. Let's have a look. Also decent. We can just update this one. Coffee addiction. One person saying, "Oh yeah, this is what we already discussed, right?" Uh, my bar is also adding to this. When I worked at UB, it surprised me how much work was done, even on games that at the end of the day looked very similar to previous iterations, Far Cry Five and Six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's also a good point, right? Yeah, it's uh the complexity from when you've worked in the industry like is is quite astonishing somehow. Let's have a look. So barrel broken. Let's get you in there. Bonk. Looking okay, nice. Uh, oh, one thing we didn't test is. Hold up. Let's do the vertex baking here. Well, we're already going to run into some issues with that one. Okay, let me let me adjust that. I kind of want something that is still visible, but it's not going to look weird. I think that will work. Hi, Maxwell. I'm looking forward to becoming an environment artist. And now that I know the basics of modeling, should I stop doing assets to purely to focus purely on environment creation? Is asset creation important? Yes, asset creation is super important because it teaches you all the basics of whatever else you're going to do in environment art up until this point. Uh, even, even in storytelling, because I think people, people underestimate how much storytelling you can actually add in an asset itself. Um, so yeah, it's definitely really important. Now, what I would suggest is to kind of look at it as like a gradient. So you're like in, in the beginning, you're just focusing on like one thing, right? Like one asset. Um, which is not only modeling, by the way. It should it should encompass modeling, unwrapping, texturing, that includes baking as well, and then ideally presenting it in like a real-time engine. Um, and then you covered like all the basics that you need to then take it a step further and maybe do like a small diorama that has a couple of assets, right? And focuses a bit more on the storytelling as well and the cohesion of everything. And then build your way up to something bigger, bigger and better. Well, just bigger, really. Um, the thing is, you don't you don't need to create something really big to become an environment artist, right? Because um, as I said countless times on here as well, is that how companies achieve scale is by adding more people onto it. So you doing the scale, like the, the main thing that that shows is obviously that you can like, yeah, you can execute it, which is good. But the main thing that that shows is ambition, right? To do like, uh, you have an eye for the bigger picture, I think. Yeah, basically, long story short, don't be like me and try to make a medieval scene if you're trying to get into the industry. Don't do that. It's a waste of time, honestly. <laughs> 
<laughs> Thanks, George, for putting that out. <laughs> I think it's very important to say that, though. Like, in this case... Well, not only in this case, probably. Don't be like me. You gotta... Yeah, you gotta... Yeah, just gotta take it slow with this stuff. Um, the reason why I keep emphasizing that is because I've seen so many people that want to make like really big environments really quick. But then what it usually ends up being is a whole bunch of separate um, separate things that are kind of like strapped together with duct tape. That's usually how it ends up looking like. Right, so that's why that's why I advise to build it up in a slow way so that you can figure out how to make like three assets work together. And then maybe you do you do like five assets or something and you keep potentially expanding it, right? But you don't necessarily have to. A barrel could do with some duct tape. <laughs> Thanks, man. Actually now that I think about it. Just realize that if uh, you're... Oh, I'm overthinking it, probably. Mm. No, I'm going to do a quick fix. I'm too lazy for this. I'm going to be honest. So the thing that I'm currently thinking is... These external rings, they create a pressure to keep, like, all the wooden sides together right but if there's no if there's no top to keep it in place then they're all just gonna fall to the middle right so we need something to keep it in place internally as well uh i'm just gonna i'm just gonna be lazy and kind of just flip this around this is probably not the way that you want to do it but hey, doing it regardless. That's a good question, Magbar. Um, So I'm going for like a very early medieval look. Um, and then they use pieces of wood or... Um, what are they called? Like twigs, right? Like very, very bendable, like twig kind of, kind of structures. I'll see if I actually have some reference here on my board. That can show. But like the stereotypical one is definitely metal, right? Because that's just, that's just was like way more durable as well. Uh, do I still have some of these references around? Let's have a look. So yeah, you can kind of see it here. Where they where they kind of use yeah, they kind of even like twist around itself to keep it keep it in place. They have like these little I didn't even notice that. They have these little like wooden pegs that keep it in place too. I mean that's a 3D pack, so I'm not spending too much time on it, but like yeah. It's cool that they have the wooden ones keeping it in place too. This, gotta be careful with this one. This is like medieval prop for hire. So this is not like an authentic source. <laughs> but this is, this is from an auction. Especially the bucket. Yeah, looks nice. Yeah, I did... I did some digging for that. Because I think I think most of my ref comes from specifically like the early medieval ages, right? Like the what is it like the 1200, 1300? I'm I'm being a bit more liberal over time, like let's say uh let's say 1100 to 1400 or something like that. I'm trying to keep it more to that broad region. But one thing I want to avoid is too much metal or if i use it i use it more in like a city type setting 
right? So that the the outskirts of the villages are still are still like made with like very uh quote unquote primitive ways of building it. And then once we get more and more to the city, that's where you see more metal stuff happening. That's also why these chests are just all made out of wood. You know, they don't have like any metal stuff attached to it just yet. And then for some of it, we're gonna we're gonna have like these more proper chests that have um, like the wooden locks and all that, uh, the the steel locks on them, like iron locks, and like the braces, just to drive home the difference as well. I think it'd be very nice. Very good question, though. Because that's definitely what they were, stereotypically. I re-export it. <clears throat> oh, God. 3ds Max 2024. You got booleans? Oh, that's awesome. I had booleans for a long time in Blender. You realize that, huh? Let's have a look. Um, bevel. This shouldn't need a bevel. So, get rid of it. Uh, edges. Need to be in edge mode, though. Sharp, and then in the weighted normals, I'll say keep sharp, and that cleans up the normals. Nice. Yeah, I think they just updated like the Boolean system for it. It's about time. It seems it honestly like this is a good thing, right? Like if they're doing these changes. It seems like they're finally paying attention then. So that's good. I'm happy for that. Nothing wrong with a bit of competition. It looks like the same thing, but less as the nine to use. Yeah. Which is all which is all you need, right? Make it easier to use. These two re-imported. This one has like the thingy holding it back. It's good. Uh, let's bake the vertex. Let's see. Yeah, it's not too bad. Deal with that. So pretty good. We're getting some nice variation in it. That's what I'm happy about. Especially on these broken ones. I don't need every vertex to be like really, really precise, you know? What I am going to do. This one, this one's pretty bad. Like I'm not even making use of this geo over here. It's not going to work. Especially the curved ones, just give them a little bit more geometry so that they're smooth. Max has been getting better over the years, to be honest. Still has a terrible reputation. Yeah, you're also talking to a person who has no idea what all the updates have been to Max, right? So, I have no clue. Like, Max was the first thing that I used. And that's when I was still in uni, right? So I have no clue what it's doing. Plus, you don't really get a chance, right? Because in, in industry, you usually use an outdated version anyway. <laughs> I think that the version that we were using was uh, 2019, I think. Yeah, it's not like we're getting the latest and greatest. Probably doesn't help. Since 15? Could be. Yeah, we had we had a couple of options, right? 
I think, yeah. I don't even remember. That's that's what you get when you only use it as like an export tool, you know? I just don't remember any of it. Ooh. Alright, so this is baked. Let's have a quick look. Oh, what the hell's that? Oh, no. Which one is that? Is that the broken one? It's this one. That. What else is new in it, though? Now that we're talking about it anyway, what else is new in, uh... The new version. Most of it looks good. Let's get it in there again. This is what polishing is all about. I had like four versions installed because they broke in various ways. <laughs> yep. Very recognizable. Okay, so this barrel is also done. Next up. Let's see, what else do we need to do here? these simple tables carpenter work table let's get one of those to be fair like we can do do some updates on these ones as well we just be quick stuff we do push that silhouette Andrea Long, pivot placement is pretty solid now, very similar to Maya. You're talking about Max, right? That's pretty cool. I did I did love the pivot placement in Maya. Even though I can have a vague I have a vague memory of how it worked. <laughs> I guess this question was asked many times before, so sorry. Don't ever feel sorry about asking questions. Like I don't, I don't expect you to watch like all the streams ever, right? So if you want to ask a question, don't, don't feel bad if you think that it's already been answered. Like, that's no, that's no excuse to not ask it. Um, but yeah, let's have a look. What are three kind of props you would like to see in a portfolio of someone applying for a junior proposition? Like furniture, for example. So the thing is, like, it doesn't matter. Right? I know that this is kind of a roundabout way of of, um, of like answering it. I want to see something that you are passionate about or something or something that you like and thought was like a good a good thing to make, right? Because realistically, you could make anything like a good game prop. Look at the recent trend where people take like very mundane stuff, right? Like a hand drill. Or like, I don't know, what is another example? Like, um, uh, I don't know, you get what I mean, right? Like very simple stuff and they just make it look really good. That's what it's all about. Like the subject matter doesn't really matter too much. Um, yeah, wooden screwdrivers. Yeah, so many of them. I think, I think what I would look at if I were to think about making a prop is look at what's popular on ArtStation or what is executed really well and how you can present it in sort of the same way, but then switching up the, the theme of it. So let's say this is a good example, right? Like wooden screwdrivers. 
It's like, cool, you know that there are like a bunch of wooden screwdrivers out there? Maybe it could be interesting to do something else, right? Like maybe, uh, let's see, let's have a look at an example here where, uh, where are my tools? The tools there. Yeah, I mean, even like a grindstone, right? Like you could, you could do so much cool stuff with this. Like a grindstone, you can make that look sick. Um, another example, let's have a look here. Yeah, just this stuff, right? Like, um, what is that, like a wooden plane or something like that? It could be nice. You don't have to take a medieval one, just make like a modern one, right? You can put like a lot of detail into it. Or even make like a very ornamental one. <laughs> yeah. I feel, I feel like the, the, the subject matter, you can make it, you can find cool stuff in like every place. Honestly. Like. There's so much cool stuff that you can make. Like. Just try to find something that really inspires you. Right? And like really motivates you for, for like building some stuff like this. That's probably the best advice that I can give. The reason why I give that advice as well. Uh, is. Because you can tell. Like. If, if you put your passion into something, that's always going to look better than something that you're just executing because you think that that's the best possible thing that you could do to get you into the industry. That makes sense. Because it is so silly. Like, as soon as, soon as you become... You don't even need to get, like, really adequate with it, I think. I think... If you are an artist yourself, you can tell which people put in the passion versus which people that were just making a concept or whatever, right? You can tell just by looking at it. So yeah, long story short, make something that is very interesting to you. And yeah, go from there. You know, just just make it look good. Hey Jeremiah. Doing good? How are you doing? Dimitro, can I can I shop a a prop I made? I never got to post it because I was thinking it's too simple. Can I shop? I think, can I post a prop I made? Is that what you mean? Go. Oh, oh, okay. Um, no, I want to keep it focused on the work here. I think, yeah. No. <laughs> no worries, no worries. I'm gonna keep it focused on like making making my own little props here. But we do we do have um events every Wednesday though, where we talk about like giving feedback to props. Yeah, if you got any more questions, I'll be happy to answer them though. Don't want to get distracted too much, you know. I'm wondering. Is it on Discord? No, uh, it's on this channel as well. Every Friday at 8 p.m. my time. So that's roughly in six hours from now. Where it would be like on a on a Wednesday. Um yeah, what are we doing here? We're making the ends a bit more intricate. We've kind of done that on this one already, so this one's good. Let's isolate this one for a bit.
don't want to make it too much, but I do want to want to add some stuff in here. Like some extra detail. Um, for the for the Wednesday stream, like we usually go through like community work first, so people that are actually apart from the community, and then if I have time, I I go through some of the some of the other people that are there live as well. So it kind of depends on how busy it's gonna get. For example, uh, this Wednesday we didn't we didn't have too many people, so we had a little bit of time. To, to go through like people in the chat as well. Uh, Jeremiah, doing good man. Still working on my environment, but recently I've had the feeling that I'm getting tired of it and uh, pretty scared. Pretty scared to be honest. Hopefully after I get some progress, I'll feel better. Yeah, what's usually, what's usually also something that you can do is look at the good stuff that you've already done to give yourself like a, a bit of a morale boost. Uh, doing that can already help. Um, what you can also do as like to take action is maybe scope down if you feel that the scale of the scene is a bit too daunting. That can also help just relieve the pressure a little bit. Yeah, for example, uh, I have the same thing. Like, I go through ups and downs with this project as well, right? Um, and I went through, like, um, a, what is it? Like, a down period, like, last week, I think? Or maybe the week before? And what I did is I just took, like, an hour to just look at all the stuff that I already did and, like, try to make it look nice. And I know, that just just, like, reinvigorated me, you know? Oh, Jeremiah, if you're doing too many new things, it gets pretty daunting sometimes. Yeah. Um, in that case, think about cutting out stuff that is too far out of your wheelhouse, right? Because there is there is also a rule with how much you should challenge yourself. Um, and there there is like a scientific like limit to how much you should challenge yourself because that's going to demotivate us regardless of what we do. So usually what I'll say if you want to focus on like improving a new skill is just focus on that skill by itself. And then once you once you kind of know what you're doing with that, then move on and add something else onto onto the thing, right? But then you're kind of doing the same as the 80-20% rule that we talked about, right? You want to be 80% like relatively comfortable and then 20% you just uh, push yourself. Like you, you're thinking outside of the box. Yeah, it is, um, it is common. I have it too. Everyone suffers with it. Uh, it's usually for different reasons, right? Like, everyone has their own kind of thing that they're struggling with. Um, for example, for me, it was the the time investment. Maybe for now, maybe jump on later. Have a good one, Tim. Yeah, thanks, my bar. Thanks for popping in and enjoy the day, buddy. So yeah, uh... Yeah, I, I struggle with that too, right? It's completely normal. The thing that I struggle with was just like the amount of time that I've already put in. And it's like, we're getting there, you know? But I still need to put in like a lot of time to uh, to actually put it to where I can be happy with it. And that can be daunting by itself. What are we doing it's like it's the stuff that I'm doing now, right? It's very slow going stuff, but it needs to be done. Like just polishing up all of these assets. Getting it to like a good final result. Takes time, takes patience. Kind of tedious, you know? I'm gonna lie. But 
but it needs to be done regardless. And we're going to move one of these up because they're right next to each other. So, another one here. This one instead. Oh, they use the other version of it. I think it's now more than 50-50. Yeah, that's a that's a dangerous a dangerous area to be in. That's a danger zone, man. Oh, Admiral Magbar was saying before, before you left, uh, I give that advice for following tutorials too. Use the same skills, but don't follow the result one-to-one. -one. Do a different gun or whatever it is. Uh, take what they're telling you and apply it differently. Yeah. Yeah, that's also a really, really good advice too. Yeah, I guess what the topic that we were talking about, right? Like how, how do you stand out basically? Just... Learn what's popular and do something different that still aligns with that. But the most important thing is always that you put in, you put in passion, right? Like that you make something that you enjoy making because you don't want to get hired for something that you don't want to be doing <laughs> eight hours a day. But this one's fine. This one is just updated. Um, I'm debating... I'm not sure about these ends anymore, honestly. Like, let's try it on this one. Wait, no. I think we we had it on. Do it on. Oh yeah, I did it on this one. Carpenter workbench zero two. Oh, let's um let's add some more geometry here because that looks a bit copy. Then I'm going to put this in the engine and then we're going to have a look at like how these mesh decals look. Let's see if that's like a good workflow. Like for these ends at least. Doo -doo -doo. That flow, such a handy shortcut. God. Right, okay. Let's do that. I think I should, I could scope it down and perhaps getting it done earlier, but it's difficult for me to understand what they exclude and everything, but I'll think about it to make sure. You can, you can actually, if you want to, if you want to know how to scope down on like a project is focus on what you want to show off and what is the most important thing in that list. Focus on that and try to replace everything else with mega scans or whatever. An example that I always use is, let's say you want to show off sculpting. So you make this like nice sculpted rune in the middle of the forest. Like, you don't care about making a forest in speed tree then, right? That's like an additional skill that you add on top of it. So just fill it out with, with speed tree. Just fill out the background and like the foreground a little bit. And just say like, hey, I use speed tree here. But the rune is something that I sculpted myself apart with the rest of the scene. And then next time, if you want to do... If you want to do foliage, 
than just isolate foliage, right? Do it that way. George, how's the process? Uh, how's the process looking like when making a console game suitable for PC? Kind of curious. Are the artists involved in it or just the tech guys and programmers? Um, I don't know. Because you're talking about like a console port to PC, right? Um, I can only speculate. Like I've never done it myself. But artists are definitely going to be involved. It might be, it might be a skeleton crew of artists right not what you normally would expect for like a full development but you're still gonna have to have discussions about like do we need to up res uh the textures do we need to uh do any compositional tweaks um uh, yeah it depends on yeah it depends on like a whole bunch of stuff right yeah but i i think they're definitely involved it's just like way less than on a normal development that's my that's my assumption Also, depending on how, how big of a graphical overhaul it is. But again, just my... My best guess. This is what we had before. And then let's... Avoid it. Yeah, it's looking nice. There's only one issue with it, though. I didn't think about it before, but these are two separate planks. How are they held together? Oh, no. Oh, no. Um, okay. Hmm. I'm gonna I'm gonna see if we can steal something from like another asset. I think uh this. This is probably not how you would construct it, but hey. Wait for that now. Piece underneath. Yeah, we could do that, but that's a curved surface, right? Um... Oh, okay. Yeah, let's go with that suggestion. What we can do... Yeah, I like that. Okay. So, what I'm gonna do... Uh, I'm gonna clean this up first. So, this is, this is the connection piece, right? Great suggestion. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna push this a little bit. Oh wait, we want to have the full width blank, right? I'm gonna do whoop. Move that up. Basically trying to get the width of the bench in there. And we'll move all of this stuff. Okay, I'm going to move it a little bit more to the side. Now we're gonna... Oh no! Screwed up all the UVs! Ah, so dumb. I left... I left correct face attributes on. Oh! Can we... Ugh. This is annoying. It's good that the UVs are not too difficult to take care of, you know? still connected what Wait, is that still connected
Have a look here. So should be fixed. Let's get out of this. Yeah, whatever. We'll uh we'll do the entire piece again. It's not difficult. Those are all the ends. These are the sides from the nails. This stuff is all just gonna be Oh, I marked that has a seam as well. We're on the struggle bus today. But hey, probably makes me just more relatable, right? Because I just uh, make stupid mistakes all the time anyway. Okay, so we've got all this. We're going to stack it all up. We're going to move it on down. I'm going to see if we can kind of just roughly put it in. I think I'm mainly worried about like the inner circle. All right, and then we'll just scale that all down. Map it onto this little section over here. Those are the tops, so they're done. I'm going to do straight new these, stack them all up. Those are the sides of the nails. I don't care too much about them, so they're just going to be over here. Just chilling. Where's the rest, though? Those are the tops. You know, straighten those out. Find them again. Scale them down. Map it to, like, the appropriate section. That's done. And just stack these. That's the main advantage of doing this technique, you know? So quick. Stack all these islands. These are all the ends. I'm gonna scale those down again. Okay, cool. UVing is done again. Yeah, it's not too bad, honestly, when you make a mistake like this. Uh, what I'm gonna do now is we're gonna flip them around. Gonna, I gotta make sure correct face attribute is off. What? What I am gonna do is we're gonna duplicate this. I'm actually only gonna retain this kind of stuff and we're gonna scale it up like using alt s which is like a uniform scale which is basically like inflates it a little bit and we're gonna use this as a boolean to cut out into into the bench itself so i'm gonna do here and then we can just sink in that other stuff and then we'll have the two pieces connected right Hi, Sarah Papa! Hey, Isan! Welcome to the chat. How are you both doing? Good to see you here, Sarah Papa. So, yeah, what I was saying is we're doing a boolean here. And we're gonna use that as a cutout. So we have this little cutout, and then we'll just sink that in there. Oh, we'll have to tweak this section of it. Not tall enough. Right? If we hide it. And then yeah, look at that. It's nice. Sweet. And then we don't have to worry about like, them two basically being separate, right? Because they're held together with like stuff underneath it. Even though barely anyone's gonna notice that, but hey. <laughs> So, yeah, let's apply that. Let's join them up. And we have this nice 
little thing. We can even have it stick out. I kind of like that detail. Yeah, so that you can kind of see that it's sticking out and that it's held together. Yeah. Yeah, but thanks for the suggestion, though. Good job, man. That, that was a great one. I love it. I love these neat little details, you know? That was, like, a good solution for, like, an issue. So, let's export that in here. Uh, let me, let me catch up here, right? We're getting, getting a bunch of questions here. Jeremiah coming up with another one. I have another question. I like to build my house in the environment using a very modular kit and using a lattice modifier. But now I look at a checker map, it looks distorted. Not much, not that much in certain pieces, but more in others. Is that normal? Maybe I should texture the trim, see how it looks. I don't know what you mean. But now if I look at the checker modifier, it looks distorted. So usually once with, with a modular kit, if you're going to then deform it using a lattice modifier, you want to make sure that it doesn't affect your EVs. Maybe that's the thing that happened. Because then it's going to skew... Yeah, it's going to skew the textures on it too, right? Um, but I don't know because you mentioned that you also should texture the trim and see how it looks. Yeah, so... If you if you have beams on your on your house, right? The the UVs are still going to be straight even though you deformed it, right? So uh yeah, let's just give a give a quick example. Here. What would be like a good example? Never live UVs, but still gets distorted. Are you are you working in Blender? Because I have no idea, like how. Well, I don't have an accurate idea anymore how that stuff works in in Maya and uh and Max. So the only thing. Um. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Like if you move the geometry, like you still get distortion, right? Um, break my brain for a bit. Yeah, maybe... Like, this is where the correct face attributes comes in, right? Um, where... You, but you can't use that with the last modifier, though. Very small modular kit and using the lattice modifier. Um, oh, but the checkers, like the checker doesn't really matter, right? As long as it's still mapped onto... Yeah, I see what you're saying. So you're worried about like a little bit of distortion in the texture showing up. But that's usually not an issue unless you push it like way too far. So for example... Um, Let's have a look if we look at some of the houses i guess you'll have to you'll have to kind of compensate with geometry right um what's a good example this beam here i guess where this uv is still mapped just completely straight right and then you just you just map it in such a way that it still feels like it's following the shape well you still map it straight and then you just deform the geometry underneath it but it doesn't matter because it's still following the trim sheet that's on top of it that makes sense like the the textile the textile density checker that you're using now um that's not going to be the final thing right so any distortion that you're seeing in that you you need to make sure that it also works with the trim sheet because that's the actual thing that you're going to be using Is wood texture look so good and crisp? Is it all just one trim sheet? Yes, it is. 
all the wood in my entire scene, just all of it, is just that one trim sheet. So yeah. And uh, yeah, I did make him, make him myself as well. Kojo man. Uh, what, what did I use to make it? So it's a combination of things. Like I sculpted it in Blender, then baked it down in Substance Painter, and then, yeah, textured in Substance Painter as well. Um, yeah, I don't think I actually did anything more than that. So for the sculpting, I used a combination of just like sculpting itself and then like an alpha to get like more of the finer detail into it. And then for Substance Painter, uh, I have like a light color map, which is just like a wood texture. And then I overlay like a bunch of additional layers with generators and all that stuff on top of it to give it like some crisper edges and work on the roughness as well. Uh, what do I do? Let's, let me go back to my little hideout here. I oh, use something like designer? No, not for this one. I use it for different textures, like uh, wall textures, for example, are made in designer. Um, wall textures are made in designer. This is also made in designer, this wall texture. Um, but this, yeah, this fabric that is still work in progress is also made in designer. So yeah, I do use designer as well. Yeah, but that's it, Jeremiah. Um, sorry for the confusion there, but get the trim done, or like, you don't have to get the trim done, but get at least like a test version in and then reevaluate. Don't don't spend too much time thinking about like the the texture or like the checker map, because that's gonna get distorted anyway. Because you're basically mapping mapping a straight section onto like a very deformed bit, right? So it's gonna have some deform deformation in it. Again, to just quickly reiterate, is the way that you get rid of that is just add more geometry to compensate for that distortion. Make it to make the transition between the sections a little bit smoother. Uh cool. What was I doing here? I think I was working on these uh, workbenches, right? Oh, I was making this one. That's right. But I forget. So, workbench 02. <laughs> yeah, also, if everyone, if everyone else has like a question or something that you're curious about, feel free to ask me anything. I would love to explain it. It feels like I'm thinking about like a prop that's made one to one and I want it to be perfect, but I think things like this can't be avoided with this workflow. No, no, it's totally fine. It's looking nice. This thing is looking good. We even get some like, little bits of details on there too. Love it. Okay, so this one's done. That one is good too. What are some of the other workbenches that we need to finish? The shaving horse. It's kind of done. Oh, yeah. Then, then we came to this one, right? Because we were kind of figuring out if we were using this kind of stuff on it. Uh, Let's actually test that. Let's actually do some testing comes to it. Right, so moving this up and then I'm just gonna remap this. What happened in here? This geo is all over the place. What have I been doing?
Let's, uh, we can actually just make this one long strip as well. And clear sharp. Uh, clear sharp, clear seam. And then we can hopefully do this as like one large strip. Oh, we're getting some some distortion in here. Let's see if we can fix that. The fire is also not going to work. Mm. Let's do some cheeky. Cheeky rotation. And basically what I'm trying to do now is like a very hacky way of kind of getting it straight enough so that it can be picked up by uh by the the tool so like a very cheeky way so uh, straighten this whoa some funky results Something like this. Oh, it's probably because we have some janky geometry going on. That's why it's acting so weird. I don't want to get down by like reconnecting and. Good suggestion though. I'm just too lazy for it, you know? Um, what are we doing here? No, we want to have it the other way around. Place again. Lightly scaled up as well. So that we don't introduce sea fighting. Then... Yeah? Kind of? Transition is always going to be like a little bit funky. And do. Let's just. The thing that doesn't really work is that it's not following the wood grain. We basically want to map it like this. Stuff is all over the place. Let's see if we can clean it up a little bit. Noise. Put this back into place as well. Not too shabby. Not too shabby.
Same thing here. Uh, reshape all. Hmm. around and then do the same thing on this side and I'll reintroduce this cut as well I don't want it to be like interfering too much with the normal map underneath did I cut the wrong thing All good. <clears throat> Andrea, do you have an article speaking about the Star Citizen modularity and workflow? Since I've read extensively about the two channel workflow, etc., but sometimes I can't really see the modules. Um So that's the benefit of that workflow, is that it's technically not really modules anymore. They just spent like way more on geometry and can can have it look like really unique and then detail it up with like reusable bits on top of it. You can kind of see you can kind of see the same workflow because I'm I'm doing it kind of here, right? With like these mesh decals that I'm adding on top of it. Uh Yeah, but it can be, Andrea. Like it can be a single asset. Because they, it's not the stereotypical modular workflow where they have to make like chunks and then they fit it together. Usually what they do is they make like unique floors with like um, more geometry and like bevels on top of them using the, the weighted normal workflow. And then all they have to do on top of it is when they want to do details, they they add like all these decals on top of it. Right, so oftentimes the geometry underneath it can be like really unique. And it's just tidable textures on top of it. Oh hi Cairo, talking about Star Citizen. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe maybe I'll bounce it to you, Cairo. Like, do you know of any good like workflow overviews when it comes to like mimicking the mid-poly workflow? Because I can think of people that showcase this stuff, but I can't think about like one dedicated article, I think. Maybe I'm wrong. Did we make one? I don't think so. Take a look and link it here if I find it. Oh, that's awesome, man. Sorry to distract you. <laughs> Just came at a perfect time. Yeah, speed run an article for us, Cairo. <laughs> yeah, but it's an interesting workflow. Like, um, the one thing that I can think of, let me quickly look it up. So, oh, there was a very good breakdown. I'm trying to think, I think the quickest way to get there. It's basically a, a person explaining it. It's basically a person explaining it um, for Unreal Engine specifically. Let's see if I can find it.
Oh, this might be it. Uh, no, it's not. Yeah, it does. It does a good job of like portraying what it's what it's actually doing, right? So let's use this as like a quick example. This is from uh, Nicolas Bortone, or Bortone. So, in this case, you can see like this is all pure geometry with tileable textures on top of it, right? So this is purely the basics, and then all the additional stuff that they add on top of it is done with just decals that are literally bits of floating geometry that are mapped to like a specific part of a texture uh, that then use parallax occlusion mapping to give the impression of depth. I know there's a bunch of technical lingo that's in there, so if you want me to explain anything there, uh, let me know. But it's basically using this texture and then you can you can add like a little square on top of it, you know? And then you can just overlay that on top of your mesh. Kind of, again, like kind of like I'm doing here, right? Like, let's, let me give um, a better example. Hi, Shitty Podcast. Welcome back. So, uh, do I have an example here? Doesn't use it anymore. So, yeah, these things, right? Like, all these kind of things that add, like, more detail to it. They are literally just like singular planes that are mapped to a certain part of a sheet that are then just overlaid on top of the base geometry. That is also what they are doing here. If we look at the comparisons again. Like that is literally just like a strip of geometry that's using the base geometry as like a template. And then they just map it onto like a specific trim that they want. Which makes it really versatile, right? Because you can have, in this case, even one base texture for like this generic plasticky looking stuff. Uh, and then you can just tint that in the engine. So you just assign like material instances based like, let's say, let's have a look at this example again, right? You have just three simple tileable material instances, one for the gray, one for the yellow, and then one for the metal. Uh, and then the rest of it is just like adding on top of it with decals. Um, Doom uses the same workflow as well. Kind of curious because there were some really cool breakdowns. Let's have a look. Felix? That's one of them. It had like a really cool breakdown in it. Let me see if I can find it. Might be Felix that was showing it off. You've seen that with normal floaters? Yeah, the only thing that's different is that they use parallax occlusion mapping, right? To simulate depth. That's the, the main the main difference there, I would say. And then just have like more geometry. So you're not baking any bevels down or anything like that. You're basically building that into the geometry, like your base geometry. Um, surfacing, please. Oh, this is cool as well. It's like an overlay of the kit. Yeah, this is the stuff that I'm looking for. So this is basically a comparison between like the base geometry and then all the decals that they add on top of it to give it more depth. You can see how how huge the impact is. I think he has some some other examples. So surfacing. Surfacing. This is a good one. Yeah. It is, right? It is, Kyra. Totally is. I think a lot of it has to do with... Oh, God. 
like companies pretending that this is like cutting edge even though like all the artists kind of know how to do it anyway right like all the professional ones at least so it's kind of like on the border of like mm, is this is this nda stuff or not <laughs> but this one is great right it shows off like the the base geometry then you add like decals on top of it uh which are just like paneling details i think he breaks it down here right so base geometry geometry decals then material blending and then the projected decals on top of it so it's basically like multiple layers to add like this this complexity are all those floaters yes like i don't know i don't know if i can if i can stop this you know but like um like this oh the dirt pass no that's probably gonna be my assumption is vertex paint because they have well it's a good question let's have a look let's see if we can break it down it seems to be pretty generic so i think that's vertex paint and then the additional dirt that they do on top of it like the final pass that's all projected decals so they just use like vertex paint to like dirty it up and to create some like extra surface variation. But then additionally on top of that, they add specific projected decals. But yeah, you can see like this is just a base geometry, you know. This guy is old Crytek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a very interesting workflow. what you can do with it it's just the flexibility of it that makes it so attractive right because you could basically have a kit um and again i haven't worked on star citizens or anything like that so this is all just assumptions you could basically have a kit that goes for like um a certain brand of uh vehicles right and then just keep reusing that same sheet over and over again because it has the same components anyway and it creates like this automatic consistency Obviously, very simplified because the consistency is still like a, a big topic when it comes to the design itself. But there is some stuff that, that happens there, which is kind of cool just because of the workflow that they use. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll add this in the chat as well so that you can, you can kind of check it out too. This is, oh, this is a good one. This is a good breakdown. So that's the thing. Like, this is also where I got the inspiration from to maybe use this kind of workflow, right? Just with, like, all the floaters. Because I'm using, like, the one trim sheet. And then I add, like, stuff on top of it, too. Thanks, thanks a lot. No worries. I'm always happy to, to to have so many good questions. Oh, some wonkiness going on here. Interesting. Sharp. Yes, so. Yeah, it's very interesting because in the grand scheme of things, what the industry currently is trying to do is adapt to the new, the new workflows and the new technological in, in technological innovations, right? Especially when we look at Nanite. Nanite is making making it so cheap to render like a whole bunch of geometry that you could technically start storing like a lot of stuff in geometry, right? Um, when it comes to this hard surfacey kind of very design stuff, we, we still need to have like a pipeline like this because you can't just like put put decals in geometry, right? That's not how it works. Um, but yeah, it's very interesting to see how different companies are adapting to 
and always adapted to like new stuff coming out. But yeah, this workflow has been around for a while. I don't even know if Star Citizen was the first one. I don't know. Might be. Uh, but 80 Isolation was using it too. Doom is using it as well. Yeah, very interesting. Carpenter work table. Let's have a look. Wait, that's number number three. We don't even have number three in here. Okay. I think I started with Crisis. Oh, did Crisis do it as well? I didn't even know about that. I did think. Yeah, I can't really think of like other examples. Like Alien Isolation is probably like the closest one that I can get to from like other games. There's a channel, they were making a Star Citizen type of game. They have a one hour long video that explains very well how to use Parallax on trim sheets. Yeah, that's awesome. Rimstar is the name. That's cool. The issue that I'm having here is because I'm using vertex color baking, is that it's... Oh... It is still... It is still... Okay, so the issue here is that it's still projecting or like adding my additional layers on top of the stuff that is technically technically an opacity map so this sh this stuff shouldn't be in here okay so i'll need to fix that that's actually a thing that i don't think i've encountered before so these work tables are kind of done move on Something else. Normal tables, I'm not really using them. Let's have a look at the shelf. Yeah, uh, on POM, like, there's a lot of resources that you can find on uh, Parallax Exclusion Mapping because that's, like, super common now. So, yeah, just just sort of, quote-unquote, apply that to trim sheets and then you're kind of good. <laughs> I think the only thing that's then different is the mid-poly workflow for the underlying geometry, right? Where you're, you're not baking down, like, any normal information. You just put the bevels there in, like, real geometry. Um... On that topic, for like good resources, what I found like really interesting is that Digital Foundry did a breakdown in like the whole Star Citizen workflow. It was actually really interesting as well. Let me let me see if I can found, find it. Um, bomb, bomb. I think it might be this one. Let's have a look here. There's like a specific section where they really show it off. I think it might be this one instead. Yeah, they go into like real detail as to what Parallax is and how it can help like make your stuff like look really, really realistic. They also have comparisons of what it looks like without it. 
Super cool stuff, this. I'll, uh, I'll share that as well. Uh... This guy is a huge fan. Yeah. Can imagine. Well, the thing is, like, I love Star Citizen as well. Just because it is trying to do so many, like, interesting technical stuff. Right? Like, it's it's actually, like, really amazing to see it. Like, it's like a giant tech showcase that's also trying to be a game. Or, like, well, not trying. It is a game, right? But, like, slowly evolving into a game. It's, yeah, it's awesome to see, man. Hey, Mark! How's it going? Happy to have you here. So, uh... Mm, can I be lazy? Probably can, right? Because we've we've had this nice looking these nice looking planks that are kinda done. I'm gonna see if we can just heal some of those. Yeah, I'm gonna start with this one. Let me uh catch up on chat as well. Uh, George is asking, have you ever been given a task during the work that you didn't manage to pull off at the end? Um, no? It's... It's interesting. Like... I feel like the question is probably a bit more nuanced than you probably make it out to be. Because didn't manage to pull off is sounds to me that um, there's a different way of looking at it, right? Like there's there's a way of looking at it like you've achieved the stuff that the Jira quote unquote told you to do, right? Um and in that case, I don't think I've ever didn't manage to pull anything off. Is there... Is there stuff that I think I could have spent, like, way more time on because I personally thought it was, like, undercooked or needed more time or, like, more love spent on it at that moment? Yes. 100%. Like, I've had that, like, a large, large amount of times, right? Uh, now, that being said, like, in, in hindsight, it usually ends up being that I was kind of wrong and like my artistic uh what I wanted to do as an artist didn't really have a big impact on what the the vision and like the purpose of the game itself needed needed from me if that makes sense right like you polishing like me in this case like me polishing like splines splines on like a little section of a town to just make it look like they're like nicely fit to the road or something like that that has no relevancy to like the actual gameplay and what people are actually going to experience right but it's it's just one of those things like as an artist you want to spend more time on it um so yeah in that case yeah i've had a lot of it and i can guarantee that a lot of people <laughs> I've had to deal with the same thing. Um, but yeah, not pulling anything off? Not really. I wouldn't I wouldn't say that necessarily. So yeah, there's basically stuff that they were like, hey, this is enough. We're not gonna continue working on it. Um, you're gonna move on to something else that's more important. That's basically what it comes down to. Hey Raj, how are you doing, buddy? Oh, we did do the underside of this, right? So probably don't want to use that. But that's a that's a good question, yeah. And I'm I'm yeah, I'm kind of proud to say that it did take like a lot of risks though. Like And I feel like that's that's what I would inspire other people to do as well like i've taken on stuff that i didn't even know how to do it like when they asked me you know like that kind of stuff i would recommend everyone to have a healthy dose of that just so that you push yourself out of your comfort zone 
Totally. Yeah. Probably not the concise answer that you were hoping for, George, but here you go. <laughs> it's an interesting one. Yeah, there was... Um, I'll bring this one up. Like, probably the most stress that I've ever had was making making the crash test dummies that are in every attraction in Planet Coaster. So that was a task that I needed to do, but I've always felt like, hey, look, I, even though like we had this vision of like, it's basically a mannequin made out of like plastic water filled kind of bottles, right? They kind of had that vision for it. Um, I was stressing like the entire time when I was making it because I felt so inadequate. Like I barely knew how to bake at that point, And that was like a fully baked, like lots of intersections with itself. And I was, oh, so stressing out when I was doing that. Uh, that's probably the, the most, the closest that I've come to, like, not being able to, <laughs> to kind of finish it. Like, pull it off in the end. That's probably, like, the closest thing. You know, like, maybe what they did is, like, sneakily behind my back when I thought I was done with it. Like, someone came in and, like, did some polish on it, you know? I don't know. Didn't look like it, but who knows? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question George thank you so much it's an interesting one because it's yeah self reflection right Because I was assigned a task during a freelance work and the quality just wasn't there at the end so another person had to redo it yeah. Um Yeah, I can I can see that hurting. I think with freelance work, you'll most likely get that more often. Because that's yeah, I don't know. Like the the company there has no real benefit in like training you up, right? They just expect you to execute a job. And it felt kind of awful after that. Oh yeah, I can imagine, for sure. For sure. Uh, contradiction. Would you recommend face weighted normals workflows for bevel still? Wait, would you recommend face weighted normals workflow for the bevel still? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Face weighted normals and like ge bevels in geometry, like they go hand in hand super quick, like super well. The thing, uh, the thing with face weighted normals is that if you have i will model it really quick. So if you have a cube, where's my cube? If you have a cube here, and then we'll take all the edges and we'll bevel it, right? And then we'll smooth the surface. Maybe even, let's take less bevels, right? Make it really... Apparent. So what's happening here is that we're shading it smooth. So it's basically going to try to like average all the surfaces. So it's kind of making it into like a weird kind of sphere. Where as with weighted normals, what it is doing, it's looking at flat surfaces. It's going to make them fully flat. And then where it's bevels, it's going to only bevel in between those two lines. So what it's going to do, it's going to look at this surface. It says like, oh, this is just going to be flat. And then this stuff in between two surfaces is going to be treated as like a bevel. So we'll add a, a weighted normal. Uh, we can kind of tweak. Like this is sort of what we had before, right? Like let's turn it all the way to say five. This is sort of what we had before. But what you can do here is that you can see <coughs> that the the flat surfaces are totally flat now. And that's why you use face weighted normals to account for those shading issues that you're gonna have that you're gonna have if you don't use weighted normals. Uh 
It was just like a bunch of stuff that's just floating in midair. Didn't even know that. <laughs> Have you experienced imposter syndrome at work at any point? Yeah, I think I just talked about that, right? I think that was a moment where I was just like, oh my god, I don't I don't know what I'm doing here. I should be able to bake stuff, you know? I should be able to do this. Like, yeah, definitely. But I think at that point, this is the weird thing. We didn't, I didn't know that it was imposter syndrome. Like, I, I have this weird look when it comes to imposter syndrome. It's just, you don't really have all the skills yet, right? So it's just a part of the learning process. I feel, this is just my opinion, right? Like, unless, unless imposter syndrome is like really paralyzing you to do anything, like, it's just learning and growing, right? Like, you have to go through that discomfort to actually come out better at the other side, right? That's kind of the way that I've always looked at it. Um, honestly... Obviously, there are moments where, like, let's say if it stops you from, like, applying to a job or where it stops you from uh, doing any productive work, then, yeah, I mean, yeah. I lost my last job, not games related to the imposter syndrome, because the people who I worked for noticed I'm not confident and think I'm not ready. It's horrible. Um, yeah. That's interesting. It's like that you lost your last job, but, um, yeah, I don't know how to react to that, right? Because there's a part of me that is like, ah, oh, it sucks. But also if you hire someone and I mean, ugh, I don't want to make this a reflection on you, right? I'm just talking in general again. Like if, if they hire you to do a job and you can't execute the job, then it's like, uh, what are you supposed to do with that? Right? Ideally, ideally right like you set all the profit like aiming at profit aside and you uh you help them grow right you help them overcome that that's the ideal situation and i think that's something that we should strive for for sure but that's in stark contrast with what's usually like the reality right well it was test month but i thought i oversold myself and i kind of led to the stress mm. i see yeah, interesting. Because, I mean, yeah, I, I brought up like an earlier conversation, right? Where I didn't know how to do it. And like that thing is still seared in my brain. Like the freaking mannequin thing, right? Was so horrible. And I'm happy for all the people that helped me, by the way. I did ask for help then. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a part of growth, right? But it might, it might honestly also be that I never really had a serious look at what imposter syndrome is like for other people. So if you have like experience yourself, like feel free to uh, share it. And then maybe, maybe that gives me some extra insight as well. Because it's, it's a, it's a really important topic, right? And I'm curious to learn more about it. It's just, I've never really taken the time. Kind of unfortunate because it is relevant though. Um, Cairo is saying sounds like there should have been feedback processes along the way to prevent that from happening and setting you on the right path uh, there were feedbacks and at the end of the texturing wasn't good enough and the time was running out so they let another artist do it who decided to do it from the beginning but man he was good yeah that's the thing right like there's that pressure like hey we need to get this stuff done so the the good situation that i had was that i could um i could take my time like there was time afforded to me and like i could have i could take my time a little bit more and like ask people and kind of get like a mini mentorship going on right on like this specific prop but yeah again it's like an ideal case right
Ja. I don't know. What is everyone else's like thoughts on like on the topic of imposter syndrome? Oh, and in the meantime, I need to recycle some of this stuff, right? So what are we gonna do here? What are we gonna reuse? I see it as an inability of producing the same quality of work that you've done before. Oh, interesting. I guess, I guess so, yeah, if you... Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I guess you could see it that way. If... If the... Um, if the imposter syndrome itself is putting so much stress on you that you're performing less than you should normally do, right? If the... If the stress and the pressure is kind of getting to you and that's causing you to perform... Uh, worse than you did before. And that's why you're degressing, right? So there's like a negative spiral happening there, potentially as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. You definitely, you could definitely see that. But that's more like the outcome of, of imposter syndrome, right? Like imposter syndrome to me was always just like the feeling that you uh, are underskilled compared to peers, right? To like really simplify it. Yeah, disproportionately affects high achieving people who find it difficult to accept their accomplishments. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, the first the first part is definitely many question where whether they deserving of accolades. Oh, interesting. I didn't I didn't even like take that part into account. Where Oh. Is it fair to say that it has like this weird inverse, well, not even inverse, like it has a weird link to humility. Whether they're deserving of the accolades? Who find it difficult to accept their accomplishment? I don't know. Is it humility? Maybe humility is a bit different. Where... I don't know. <laughs> I definitely find that some of the least productive uh, slash motivated people have a complete lack of imposter syndrome. Oh, that's, so, that's also interesting. It's also interesting to think about. I only find that some of the least productive motivated people have a complete lack of imposter syndrome. Interesting. Because you would then assume that they're not like hindered that they're not hindering themselves in the progression of their skill set, right? If you don't have imposter syndrome? Technically? Is that a fair assumption to make? This is this is nice though. Like just being able to think about that stuff. I've never done that before. And I'm trying to think if I can come up with like relative or like relatable situations where that might be true. Because I honestly feel that I talk to a lot of people that are the inverse, right? Like the people, the people, the people get into, into their own way, even helped by like imposter syndrome or something like that, right? Where they where they say like, oh, I'm not good enough and I'm never going to be good enough. So why should I bought that kind of, that kind of spiral, right? I, kind of like what Sarah Papa is saying as well. I think let's, uh, let's have a. Could never accept people's compliment of what I've done because I've never felt good enough. 
Yeah, in that... It's weird, because then I still have it too, right? Like, I... I'm, I've gotten used to just say thanks, right? But, like, internally, I still don't believe that... <sighs> I think the word that I produce is good, but not as good as people make it out to be, if that makes sense. Like, I have a way a way higher standard than people have for me? Is that a, is that a way of saying it? Damn, I'm really... <laughs> He's scratching that's in my brain right now. I think that's what happens, right? Like when people say, when people give me a compliment, I usually just say thank you. And then I just immediately revert to, um, I know that there's still more work to be done. That's my kind of thought process. Like, it's like, thank you. And then I just shut up because I know that the internal part, like, <sighs> They're not gonna. They're not gonna care about like me just over and over saying like, "Oh, I still need to do more work," you know. But that's how I feel. Yeah, we're always our biggest critics. Yeah, and I think the danger with that is that sometimes we don't know where to stop. Right at a certain point, that's kind of what I talked about before when people take you off a project even though you want to keep going. Right, like you know that there's still so much to be done, but there's just a time where yeah there's just a time where you can't keep going i found that the most talented people are usually the most critical of their work i think so i i agree with that yeah because i think i think to be critical about your own work there is a certain there's a certain amount of healthy introspection that needs to happen where you need to objectify your own work and to a certain degree your own self and your ego put that all aside and then look at your work in an objective way to help you grow all right so i think i think being being objective about your work can also like also makes you like a better person is that a stretch i think so i think it's not a stretch i think i think that makes sense because to me, at least, like what it also does is I'm very, I try to be very objective with my work and like very critical, but I also know that other people are going through it. So there is like an empathy side of it too, where I know that I shouldn't say like certain things because they are just too, too over encompassing for them to comprehend. Not to comprehend, but like to apply to their work. I'll give an example. So if someone asked me like, hey, what should I do? I genuinely, like I sometimes don't even give the stuff that I think they should be doing, but the stuff that is more approachable for them to be doing and to be focusing on to make the biggest steps. Like I'm trying to basically minimize the amount of work that they need to do versus the biggest gains that they're going to get out of it. Right? And sometimes that leads to like, hey, look, you're making an environment. Maybe don't make an environment, make a prop instead, because that's the right approach. But it can also be people that are like 90% done with their environment. That doesn't doesn't look good because the foundations are wrong. I'm not going to say that the foundations are wrong. It should start from scratch, right? I'm trying to min-max the, the feedback there. And that also comes from... Well, first experience, but also like the humility side of things and like the empathy side, right? Because I got to be honest, like I did some of that stuff before where you would just say the truth and nothing but the truth, that kind, that kind of thing, right? And it can completely like demotivate people, like completely. So yeah, it's not the best way to approach it. Um, but yeah, back on the topic of imposter syndrome, uh, Sarah Papa is saying when it becomes an issue is when it's debilitating, these two burnout, etc. Yeah, 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 for sure. It, because it's kind of weird, like I feel, I feel like, yeah. But, <laughs> The chat mindset. Struggling for a while, feeling like a piece of crap, and then something clicks and stuff goes smoothly, and thinking you're a god and you cannot die, and then rinse and repeat. 
Wasn't that wasn't that the Danny Kruger effect? You know, where you have this graph where you're like, oh yeah, it's awesome. And then it's like, oh shit, like it just keeps on repeating itself. But like the, the ground floor of it like moves up like every time I feel. Because the Danny Kruger thing is um it's just one graph, right? And you have this curve, but I feel like the curve goes up every time. Like the base of the curve, if that makes sense. Because you're learning and you're taking stuff in and you're like growing as a person as well. Yeah. Very interesting though. Yeah, I think my... It's not really an issue, but what I sometimes maybe even get confused by when people talk about imposter syndrome is that they're... Also a little bit afraid to just uh, challenge themselves, right? I think I think there's like a weird kind of overlap that happens there where it's it's totally normal to have stress to do something that you're totally uncomfortable with. But that's also where a lot of the learning happens, right? And yeah, is that closely tied to like imposter syndrome? It can be, I think. But it's also then quite necessary to grow. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting one. Uh, let's see. What am I doing here? Apart from rambling. I'm like having a good discussion. I wouldn't call it rambling. Thank you so much for bringing up the, the good conversations, people. I love it. It's a good introspective one as well. Create some additional variation in here. I gotta be honest, when when because I, I recognize the curve, right? Sarah Papa, what you said is like struggle for a while, feel like a piece of crap, something clicks. And then you feel like a god and you, you cannot die. Yeah, I feel maybe. Yeah, no, I was about to say like I don't go through that anymore, but nah, it's totally right. Like I still have that. Like you have that endorphin rush, right? Where it's like, oh god, yeah, I figured it out. Finally. When you're spending like four hours trying to work something out. Oh my god. Sometimes also nothing better than that. But I do also have these times where I'm just like, oh God, I finally figured it out. Let's move on to something else. You know, <laughs> like there's no, there's no pleasure or like no, no positivity that can be gained out of that conversation. <laughs> just like, God, I'm finally figured it out. Great. Maybe that side leans into the, the imposter syndrome a little bit. Could be. Where it's like, I should have known this kind of thing, right? Like... I've been a professional. I should have known this. Why is it taking me so long to figure out, like, I don't know, how to make, like, a texture or whatever? Hey, Antonio! How's it going? I think I've already changed some of this stuff, did I? Honestly, don't want to do too much on this. I think this is quite good. Let's check it in the engine, shall we? Very sick. Sorry to hear that. Hope you get better well. Oh, hope you get better soon. Being scrambled. Yeah, I'm doing good though. Doing good, making some good progress. <laughs> Sarah Papa. Oh my god, I love that. I mean, a lot of the great artists weren't quite right in the head. I don't know if you're talking about me, not the greatest artist out there. But uh, yeah, thanks for calling me unhinged. Appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> now, I think you're right. I think, I think you have to have like a unique sort of mind and be like really introspective and like think about the world in like a different way to... 
to have a different view and then also be able to portray that view as a visual tool to other people, right? That's technically what we're doing with art. Or that's... Let me take a step back. That's technically what we should be doing if we are making art. And I want to make a distinction between art for art's sake and production art. Because I feel that there's like a vast difference between people that just make art, right? Even though they still use 3D. Or what we tend to go into, which is more like the production side of things, right? Where... I'm hesitant to call it just like factory work, but for art, sometimes it kind of feels like that, right? Like, we've, we're not really on the spectrum of creativity versus production. Like, there's not that much creativity that you normally do in your day job versus if you're just an artist, the, the, the graph is probably going to be flipped, right? Where you have crazy ideas and you want, just want to execute and visualize them. Where we are oftentimes stuck with the production the production side of things. Yep. Bound to the constraints and requirements in production. For sure. But I think... Uh, let me see here. Mark is also saying, I feel like that's because we have to retain such a vast amount of information and remembering stuff sometimes is like wandering around in a huge library trying to find the right book. Yeah, I think so. And I think it's also like the, the more you access that information, the closer to the door of the library is going to be, right? So if you if you don't spend too much time on like I don't know reading up upon a certain topic that usually makes it like very difficult to to come back to it right that's why we call it like getting rusty because the book is just like further back in the library you need to refresh it I like that analogy it's a good one now let's make sure that we have everything in there and what are we doing here one. Oh, we definitely need to change that one because the pivot on that is also wrong. The hmm. Okay. Main issue that I have here is that they're all the same height, right? So maybe maybe we can make another one, or like not another one, but like change the dimensions a bit as well. But I think artists have a very different approach to their craft. It's a very personal experience and you're really up against yourself. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. Yeah. That's... <sighs> the weirdest thing is, is um, I give people the recommendation to ask for feedback, right? And I love to give feedback myself. But if if I have to, like, open up about that, like, I've... I've never been good at asking feedback and I barely did any of it, you know, because I was like, hey, I have a vision in my head. I kind of have a benchmark set by like external people um, and I'll kind of figure out my own way, right? I was kind of like um, very selfish slash independent when it comes to that. Damian, you just went on a vacation in Slovenia with your fiance. Got fascinated and started taking taking pictures of a public toilet under a bridge because the uh, texture was just amazing. Yeah, yeah, nice. So many things that can inspire us just from like normal life. Um. Okay. So. What are we gonna do here? Are we gonna cut this off? Like remove the top shelf maybe that's what we can do I just can't wait for Hidini 20. What is that? New version of Houdini? What's happening? 
Tell us all about it. That's right. Let's let's do something like this. Oh, you know what we yeah, because I'm calling these small, so we might as well make this one small as well. Let's do that. Beauty noted thought. To be great, I do not ask. Oh, no, Sarah Papa, no. <laughs> That's not what I meant. <laughs> great asked him. Oh, my God. Imposter syndrome. Here we go. Like, thank you. <laughs> Oh. Don't like that. Don't like that at all. Oh, this has these uh, slits into it, so we might need to do something different here. This is just a test, right? To lure out my uh, imposter syndrome. Sarah uh, Papa, to just get me to go through it live on stream. I get it now. I see what you're doing. Oh, it's probably easier to just like build them up again and then just remap them. Uh, do a little inset. Do the seam. Move it up a little bit. The devil. <laughs> Beam pushes down a little bit. Variation. And then we're just gonna quickly. Oh, what am I doing? Oh, just like an error message from Unreal. Bonk. Let's map that onto this section. Ah, uh, see, it just did like some of the other pieces of the UV as well. Hey there. Ooh. Maybe it's time that I need to update to like a new version or something. Maybe I'm missing like a crucial update. That's cool. Let's change those in the build. <laughs> Mm. Let's have a look here. I used to not ask for feedback when I was doing some modeling creative work, but as I started to take game art more seriously, the main piece of advice was to ask for feedback and know how to receive it. Yeah. I think, honestly, um, with my little story that I didn't ask feedback before, right? In hindsight, I also realized that I handicapped myself and that I could have gone way better if I just asked feedback to people. Because, like, the industry kind of taught me that, right? I didn't know that before. But, yeah, the industry kind of taught me to just be open about it, you know? And detach myself and my, my self-worth from my work. Which was also, like, a, a really good lesson. Because sometimes we're just way too close to what we do. And that leads into, like, awkward situations where you want to defend it. Even though, like, a person is just trying to help you on the other side. That's like a, a valuable lesson as well. Did that change this one here? Nope, this one's still all right. What we'll have to do is we'll have to update the pivot point of the other shelf as well, this one. It's already looking good in Blender, but let's have a look. Houdini is great if you want to take advantage of procedural workflows. Yep, 100%. I wonder if you can't do similar things with Blender Geo Nodes. Didn't get into that. Yeah, I made my own tree generator in Geo Nodes. Uh, so you can definitely do like a bunch of cool uh, procedural stuff. Um, what else did I use it for? I made like a title generator where I basically take... Um, it's super simple stuff, right? But like where it takes like a couple of assets, it scatters them 
and like layers them on top of each other. Uh, lays them out in such a way that it's attainable, and then I just need to take that out as a high poly and bake it down onto a plane. And that's it. So you can do like really cool stuff with Geo Nodes. Um, also, geometry scripting inside of Unreal can also be like very interesting. I I have my re really weird cube over here, but this is this is also just using like geometry scripting, right? So you can do like procedural stuff here. And then just like, I don't know, build in all the stuff you need, right? So that was like a little test to just open up the floodgates on that. That was really interesting. But yeah. Takes so much time to get into it, you know? I think out of all the procedural tools, if you have to look at it, like Houdini is still the best one out there. No doubt about that. Stuff got misaligned here. Just noticed that. Still good. Mm. Still good as well. Yeah, also there's a there's a cool plugin called Alter Mesh where you can have, uh, it basically creates a bridge be between Blender's geometry nodes and Unreal Engine. So the stuff that Houdini does really well, where it has like engine integration, um, there's a plugin for that in Blender. I haven't tried it yet, but it's out there. Okay, so we got these shelves done. We need to adjust this one. I think I might be cheeky with this one. I'm just going to grab all we need from this one. So I just want these lanky boys and like all the details. Um, yeah, there's so many, like, interesting procedural tools out there. Or, like, interesting procedural applications. Right? Because you also just have blueprints, too. Like, you can do, like, a lot of cool stuff with blueprints as well. So we're set at lines. Question for everyone here. Who's who's already taken a deep dive into like, I don't know, let's say Houdini. Who's done it? Because I've been saying it for like a couple of years, but I haven't done it yet. Like, actually. I'd be curious to, to kind of know what you think about it and what your first thing you made was. Antonio, how? What how? Who, what how? I was about to ask you how Houdini is treating you. Oh, I don't I don't use Houdini. Like uh It's for me geometry nodes and blueprints is all I needed up until this point. 
plus what I uh, generally don't want to do is add add more uh, programs into my pipeline for no reason. Right? Like if I can do it with another tool that I'm already using, uh, I don't see the need to make the jump to Houdini. Does it do cool stuff? Yeah, for sure, hundred percent. Is it absolutely necessary if you want to do something procedural? No. You can do it in other ways. Dive into a bit of Houdini, a big bonus to know someone, uh, to know some basic coding and math. Yeah! Yeah, honestly, like just having that basic programmer knowledge, right? Where you know uh, is statements, for loops, branches, like all that kind of stuff is super useful. I think that applies to blueprints, Houdini, uh, even... Even just logical thinking, right? Even geometry scripts, even though it doesn't use like the stereotypical format, it's still it's still handy to have like the base logical format that you can kind of lean into. So yeah, that's definitely like super handy. University just provided us a video from Houdini, which is private to us, but want to give it a go like tech art. Um. Yeah, that's what you want to do. Do it. Let's get rid of these top planks already. I've been to a bit of Houdini. What did you make, Damian? Or is it is it NDA stuff? Then uh then ignore the question. <laughs> I don't want to go too crazy with the scale difference. Gotta hop into an art review. Thanks for popping in, Cairo. Have fun. My life is a greater mystery of what I want to do in my life. Yep. Definitely sounds like it. Just gotta keep trying then. We've talked about it like a bunch of times before already, right, Antonio? Gotta keep trying. And ideally finish some stuff. I think honestly that, that would be like the biggest priority. Just trying to finish some stuff. Doesn't matter what. Doesn't matter how. Try to finish something. And then use that momentum again. To Chio. Just for fun, actually, made some cog generators, some basic simulations. Yeah, it's awesome. I love the work that uh, some of my friends have worked on, like Project Titan, like the demo project for um, for Houdini. Well, side effects in that case. Like, uh, the stuff that they did on it was like super inspiring. Super cool to see that. Love it so much. I think it's stuff like that, you know, where I see other people use it and I'm just like, ah, oh, that would be, would be cool. You know, I want to do something like this now, even though it has no relevancy to, I don't know, the stuff that I'm doing now, just like so inspired and in the moment. 
Like who? Everyone has those moments, you know? When you just look at a project and you're like, dang, I want to do something like that. I had that with Project Titan. Cool world building, cool tools, nice amount of assets. Yeah, just inspiring overall, you know? Antonio believes that you should explore more outside of 3D modeling. Yeah. But I give it a try, you know? Ubisoft use it so heavily. Um, yeah. Yeah, we do. Well, we... Not working there anymore, but yeah. Definitely did. I mean, it makes sense for generating large open worlds, you know? So, of course, they're going to leverage that. They have some They have some cool talks about that, where uh, they have a talk about, like, Far Cry 5 and how they use it to build, like, biomes and generate the biomes there. Really cool stuff that they do with the tech. You love the Far Cry tools. Okay. Cool. But that tool is similar to the new tools from Unreal Engine for environment. Um, no, not really. I mean, I get what you're saying, right? Like in, in terms of like raw output, it might be similar. Um, but like the way that it works, like the way that it handles stuff, like it's, it's not, not similar at all. There, there is some freaking awesome tech, like inside of, inside of like uh, Ubisoft's games that uh, that just goes unnoticed, like unless you're really diving into it. And I didn't even understand it until until I started working there. Right? It's like, uh, yeah, That's some really cool tech. I'm curious to see what they're gonna do with their next games as well. What's that? Mm. Hey, Mazeltov! How's it going? Okay, so now we got like a, a row of these planks. Now we just need to kind of make them a little bit more unique. Not necessarily unique, but like. It's a little bit different. But the new tool set in Unreal Engine is looking freaking awesome though. Like I want to I want to play with like the procedural generation content. Like I want to play with that. Um Yeah, it looks like really nice. But Papa saying Ubisoft games that have have that really amazing environment art, I feel it feels very believable. When I played Watch Dogs 1's Watch Dogs 1, I so wanted to go to Chicago, but then I looked at in real life Chicago and was like, mm, maybe not." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's um yeah 
That's how you know that they did a good job, you know? Like making making like unappealing locations like very appealing in games. <laughs> I honestly this sounds like a vendetta that I have against Chicago, but I have nothing against it. But I think yeah, I think that's what games should do like way more, right? Well they're kinda of doing that. Like where they lean into like the real life stuff and then make it like a game location again. Yeah. They do they do have fantastic environment art though. Like that's for sure. I'm really curious what how they're gonna push that with the new uh avatar game. I guess I guess we might I don't know. I don't know if we're gonna see anything anything like Are we gonna see anything? I mean, I generally have no idea, right? Uh, gonna have to go now. Hopefully I can join voice chat for the chat during the weekend. Yeah! Looking forward to seeing you there, Jeremiah. And thanks for popping in as well. Now we can just duplicate this to like the stuff underneath it. Oh, did we, did we remove the beams as well? Was that that? Oh no, okay, never mind. Cool. Mark is saying the best environmental storytelling I've seen is nailing the look was in Far Cry Horizon. Ah, uh, Far Cry. Forza Horizon 4. Uh, from nowhere near the game, it's set in Northern England and they really got it. Help me feel homesick. Yeah, that game was awesome. Like, it just... That game nailed a lot of it, you know? Like, it nailed just a lot of it. Like, the, the atmosphere, like, the, the art, like, the, the way that the, the game was constructed just by itself. Yeah. Do have a kick-ass team working there, though. The best environment art experience I ever experienced was, like... Uh, okay, I'm actually going to a trip to this location. It was Red Dead Redemption 2. It's in the knee. It's just magical. Yeah, I didn't play too much of it. Kind of stopped after a while. I don't know. But it is, it is great, though. It's a lovingly crafted game. Yeah, I'm trying to think what is what is my my favorite one favorite one when it comes to environment art. <sighs> I'm a big fan of all the Fallout games. In terms of environment art, it must be Fallout 4. Because, like, I don't care about the story, right? I don't care about the story, like, but there were so many, like, very nicely put, like, environment art storytelling that was going on in that game. Like, it was just so inspiring, you know? Because you could... They were so... They were so good with, uh... I don't know, just these mini stories, you know? Like, there was always something that you could look at that was kind of, like, fleshed out and you could kind of make something... Out of it. So good. Did a super high standard in my head toward... Uh, can't wait for GTA 6. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not, not personally a fan of GTA. Oh, Damian. Yes, that's a very good one. Uh, I actually have it on my reference board. Kingdom Come Deliverance is so good. Like, they nailed it, you know? Like, the forest in that game, like you're saying? Oh, they're so good. 
I'm not gonna lie. I used I used like like inspiration from that game to do like uh, some of the houses and some of the locations that I'm gonna be doing. Uh, so yeah, the game is freaking amazing. I think it's also so underappreciated for what it is. I don't know if people agree, but yeah, it feels like it feels like a cult hit kind of, right? Got to do one thing though. Got to scale down my UVs because we got like a little bit of squishing happening in the middle. Let's uh if you have a look, we can resolve that real quick. Bob, bob, warm. Environment art for me is Ghost of Tsushima. Um, Ghost of Tsushima has a good art direction. Like, that has a fantastic art direction. Not too sure about the environment art itself, though. I don't know. It's, it's kind of weird, right? Because they kind of should go hand in hand. But I think like the art direction and the, the way that they embedded like everything in it is amazing. It's just that the environment art in it itself kind of feels flat, you know? Like sometimes you, you can you can kind of tell or like at least in my opinion. And maybe maybe comparing it to like other open world games is also not really doing it justice. But yeah, I kind of have the feeling that th there's some areas that are just like undercooked, you know, like you walk through them and you're like, mm, OK. I can appreciate it for what it is like in in the in the game that you're playing, right? But it's also, yeah, sometimes I got this feeling of just like, eh, want just a little bit more out of it. I don't know if that makes, or if that's relatable to anyone. But that doesn't take away from like the beautifully art directed world though. I feel like everything is so consistent in that game and it is beautifully tied in or like woven into each other. I think that's what I that's what I love the most about that game. So beautifully tied into in together. So good. Randomize this a little bit. bit more and then I want to just take like a random small selection and then just do something like this you know where we move it over so that we get some get some variation in the texturing yeah just quick variation like that nice Yep, Stray is a, a great use case or like a great um, study for like lighting. Love that. Stray's lighting is beautiful. It's um, it's interesting. I've been following the development of that game for like ages, and um, that person he's not he's not that known for it anymore now i guess with with the next generation of like game devs coming up um but he like i think the main the lead artist i think on it think or art director i don't know what is what his title is on that game but he was very famous for making these like beautifully like lit scenes in a religion before they started working on hong kong dev blog which was like the original name that was actually a blog of stray which you can still find, I think. Um, what was his name again? He had like this weird name. Um, or like this weird, like not a weird name as like his actual name, but like a weird nickname. I don't remember it now. Yeah, like I, like a lot of people knew him because he was doing these like fantastic, like uh, lighting scenarios, like in Unreal Engine.
Buzz, yeah, yeah, you looked at the blog. Yeah, really interesting. Yeah, I'm um trying to think about the name. I can't I can't think about it. I need to I need to look this up. Um trying to think. Oh, here we go. Comes up as like one of the first couple of things. Like if I just type in like Unreal Engine Lighting Study. Have a look. Kula! There we go. That's him. But it was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh, la, 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 la. That's basically like his name. Um, I think... I think he might be... I think he's still working there. I, I don't know. I don't know about, about the person that much. Um, let's, let's, sh let me share this. Like, this is his personal YouTube channel where he does like a bunch of lighting studies. And... Well, not only lighting, but like he makes these really cool dioramas where like everything works so well together. So nice. Yeah. His work was like really inspirational. Like because he was pushing the graphical fidelity, you know? Some really cool stuff. Uh, what's going on with my UV map? So this is UV map. Let me move that. Catch up on the chat as well. Uh, Ghost of War. Uh, Ghost of War. My god, I'm really jumbling everything. Ghost of War has great environment R2, but games like that aren't to my personal taste. Yeah, and I think I think that's actually like a great statement, you know? Like I can I can absolutely like not like to play the game, but I can still appreciate it for what it's contributing to like the the artistic field, you know, if you want to call it that, or what it's doing, like on its visuals. Um, what would be like a good example of it? Um, yeah, I love Gears of War, so I can't, I can't throw Gears of War on the bus. I haven't played like, I think, I think I have like very nostalgic like childhood feelings about it because I used to. That was my go-to co-op game with one of my best buddies. So that's where, where that comes from. Uh, oh yeah, a great example is Bioshock. I didn't like that game, you know? Or maybe even Dishonored. Because Dishonored is like seen as like the pinnacle of like... Um, art, art direction? And like artistic... Artist, uh, like visual integrity? Or um, yeah, let's call it art direction in this case. Um, don't like the game at all. Like I don't like Dishonored. You know, but I love watching other people play Dishonored so that I can just like gawk at like how they did stuff. You know, I love that. Love it. Love it. Um, wait, it norms. Keep sharp. There we go. This is gonna look way better. They might screw up with some of the stuff that I already placed, placed in there. Buzz, I don't like style games, but Dishonored was great. Yeah. And yeah, that's the thing, right? Like, I know so many people that are like, oh, it's so great. And I just, ugh, just can't. I don't know. I don't have the patience for it. It's probably the best way that I can describe it. Which is fine, right? Not my type of game. Um, Rukti. Hey, first question from a silent viewer. Yeah, welcome, welcome to the chat, and happy you're answering. Uh, happy you're asking a question. <laughs> so, is it better to leave UV shells rescaled in proportion to the model, or scale parts around to maxima to maximize the use of UV space and better texture resolution? Oh, yeah, maximize UV space for sure. Ideally, you want to just like uniform scale everything, right? The reason why it's so, so important is because if you're not maximizing your UV space, you're basically throwing out pixels, right? And when it comes to that, textures are probably the most expensive thing when it comes to the actual budget that you can have on the game because they take up so many resources. 
So basically, if you're then, if you then don't make use of them in the UV space, then you're basically just throwing out like megabytes, megabytes to even gigabytes if you do it on like a lot of stuff, right? So definitely make the most of your UV space. And thank you for uh, for the good question as well. Need to make sure that all this stuff all has sharp edges. A little bit tedious to select this, but. Select all of that. We're going to turn that into select boundary loop and then just select like make sharp. Nice. <clears throat> get the shelf in oh yeah it's gonna it's gonna screw us up anyway because i adjusted the pivot so all right Onk. and then now this one in here is gonna be rotated as well so i have to go here Feels like I can use like a bit more geometry though. Like it kind of feels like very low poly. Now that I look at it again. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna do that later. So I'm gonna move this over here. We'll do something else in the meantime. What else can we do? <clears throat> Sarah Papa bought the new uh, Colossus from Wolfenstein just to look at the environments up close, but I didn't like the game. Yeah. Yeah, it's so tough. Like, sometimes you just have these games where you're like, oh, I just want to, I just want to explore it, right? But then... <laughs> It's such a weird issue to have as an environment artist. Sometimes the game gets in the way for you just exploring it. Like, I'll give you an example, right? I would love to go explore the Dark Souls games or like Elden Ring or whatever. But I honestly, I just can't be bothered with fighting enemies. So I just don't buy it. Like, you know, like, <laughs> it's so ridiculous, but. That's what happens. Add some more detail to this one. So yeah, that's also why I'm always like running behind on the games, I feel. But like, I'll watch games, you know? I get more enjoyment out of like watching games than actually playing. In a lot of cases, at least. Scaling some of this stuff down because it feels like very thick. But I'm probably not going to be the only one. That's just not playing a game, but like actually watching it. Mm. 
and have that sort of ramp up. <laughs> Sarah Papa, you're reading my mind. I was I was about to ask like what is your worst one? Uh My worst game experience was Metro 2032. Uh 33. Amazing world building, atmosphere, and nice post-apocalyptic environments, but I had to stop midway because the fighting was relentless. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Like, I hated, in that game, I hated going to the surface. Oh my god, it was so annoying. Like, I just despised... I think that's probably what they wanted to set up as well, right? And if they did, they did a really good job at that, because, oh my god, me going to the surface? Oh, I hated it so much. This is the worst game. With uneven textile density at times. Yeah. Um, to to add on to that, Fruchti, um You're gonna end up with like little inconsistencies with textile density, right? But in terms of... In terms of like the grand scheme of things, you should only be worried about textile density when it is... When it's not noticeable visually. Right? To give you some concrete examples, you can deviate from your textile density when it is, let's say, 15 to 20%. Right? So if you make it, uh, if you go above it 20%, that's fine. Don't go above that. Or if you go, if you go uh, below that, then that's also an issue. Uh, that's, that's how I would see it in terms of like textile density. Thanks for a great time. Finish with work, so be watching you next time. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Damian, for joining in. Thank you so much, and have, uh, have a great day. Yeah, the, the reason... Because, because sometimes we get so bogged out with, like, all these technical explanations or, like, technical restrictions, like textile density, right? Is that just... Yeah, just keep in mind that there's flexibility within those things too. Um, what I'll also add as like an additional explanation is um, if you run into if you run into issues where you have an asset that is like way under textile density, find find relevant props where you can add them on top of that, like in, in like a shared texture then. That could also work, where you start sharing textures between props that are kind of small, right? And you're kind of building like an atlas out of like smaller textures. It could also help. Yeah, thank you for the question. Let's add some, let's add some, uh, oh, that's not, let's add some bolts on here. I love this little trick as well. Oh, wait, let's, uh, let's solve some of this stuff first. I'll show you all like a nice trick to just add like these little pegs onto onto your uh, props if you wanted to. Like if you go into like the snapping settings here, you can actually set it to phase project and then you set it to like active and then it's gonna take the active pivot. And then once you duplicate it and you start snapping, you can just take a location on that asset. Like really useful. I'm gonna scale it up a little bit though. We could then just duplicate uh, Add that one in here. Done. You know, speeds it up like really. Makes it all really quick.
And you can just start adding this all over the place. Where do we where do we need to have one? No worries, best of luck with your portfolio. up a little bit really like this quick molding with the trim sheet gonna have to try it myself yeah it's so cool right like acids don't take that long to create when you have something something working and then they get the detail from, from the material inside of unreal engine right i don't know what what is a good example but like all this this kind of additional detail that's happening on top of it where you have like little bits of dirt and stuff that's all just in engine you know i don't need to do anything for that well i do need to do one thing it's uh baking vertex vertex color but that's it super simple you can kind of see like i'm i'm using this is a clean version and then this is a the same pot you know like no no new texture it's just using a new material instance that has like the the parameters changed a little bit. So yeah, you can it's just like tweak it up or down. Tweak this up and down as well. Makes it very versatile, you know. That also makes it so that um Let's say I have one of these. Right? I can just say like, oh, this needs to be a little bit cleaner. And then we have some fresh wood. Also, I have like really old stuff, you know, it's probably like a bit too old. But yeah, we can just tweak it on the fly, right? Really versatile system. Make it a little bit less green though. So cool. These pegs here. What do we want? Peg over here as well. Keep that in. You said you made the trim with sculpting and blender, right? Yep. Exactly. Here, what is that doing here? Oh yeah, I didn't texture them in Substance Painter. So yeah, very straightforward and simple workflow, honestly, to create a trim sheet. I think the, the difficulty with a trim sheet is always planning it, right? Um, I'll share I'll share a document that that I've uh, me no that Scott one of uh, one of the members of our team wrote about trim sheets. I'll uh, share that in the chat as well.
Hey Netraraj, your work is already looking awesome. Your weekly live stream is very long and very informative for anyone learning game environment. It's very rare to see good quality art streams. I think honestly, like the where the quality really comes from is from people asking good questions. You know? Like that's that's where the good quality comes from. So yeah, I'm happy that people are asking such good good questions that can help them and also potentially others, right? Because I can, I can sort of guarantee that there's going to be people, people in the chat that want to ask questions, but they, they think it might be like a dumb question, which it's not true. There's no dumb questions. Um, but then you have people helping them out by just asking that question themselves, right? How does this actually work? How does this section work. Do I actually have some ref for that? Mm. Have a look. Wheelbarrows. You gotta be careful with this stuff, right? Because this is uh, this is a prop hire, right? So this is like movie props for, well, for movies. We got to be careful to not lean into those too much. Curious to see. What is this doing in wheelbarrows? This is a bit of a modern, like a more modern technique, I guess. But they just have like one pin going through the entire thing and then they have a pin that rotates around it. Oh, Sarah Papa, that's a very good question. Why do you have to be careful about movie props? So the reason why I mentioned that you have to be careful with them is because you don't know if they, they have taken liberties in how something is constructed, right? So if I'm using this, if I'm using this to look at how they've constructed something, it might not be genuine to how they would actually have constructed something. Right? So for example, if I'm looking at this connection, like I'm trying to figure that out, uh, they might just kind of have faked this whole mechanism because it doesn't necessarily need to work because no one's going to be using it. That might happen. So I want to be careful with that, that I verify it with like an authentic source whenever I can. Yeah. Like, um, there's to me, there's like a couple, couple of layers of uh, references, right? And you basically have to be careful whenever you use, for example, game game references are like a good one, right? Um, the reason why I tend not to use that many game references is because they serve a specific purpose for me. And that purpose is like, what does exist in that world? And then I can use that as a base to start looking for the actual thing myself. Because if I... I have like a bunch of game references here, right? Um, but if I then start looking at like, I don't know, like a house, right? Maybe they've taken some liberties with how something is constructed and I don't want to get into that trap myself. So I use this as like, oh, this is a cool house. What does an actual house look like and where is this base from? And then start looking into the, the inspiration that they used, right? So you can... You can get like closer to the source material possible. Doesn't mean that they don't serve a purpose, right? Just want to make that clear. It's just you got to be careful with how you use them. Um. Yeah. So what are we doing here? So well, we kind of got the core of it already. We're just gonna gonna change some of the proportions. goes in there this goes fill that up a little bit make that way longer 
what we might actually do for this one is have it come out at the ends and then do like a boolean thing again so where we duplicate that we're going to separate it And I'm basically gonna separate all of this because that's interfering with the boolean operation that I'm gonna do just in a bit. So this is gonna go to a separate thing. I'm gonna take these two pieces and then just boolean the shape out of it. Maybe even a little bit lower. Somewhat in the middle. It's good. This. For the wheel, I'm just going to be lazy because we have the wheel lying around anyway. So I'm just going to replace that with another wheel. Lazy where well, you can be lazy. Um Maxime Sharp What's that? Oh we didn't we didn't do a seam. Do it on the underside of this. Right. And we can just stack all of this up. Oh. An awful stack. Better. Uh, where are we gonna put that on? Let's first get it down. Guess we can just. Put it on there. Scale it just a little bit more. So that we don't get that awkward seam. <clears throat> Nice. Cool. Slowly but surely, we're breathing life into this. This wheelbarrow. There's honestly something like very satisfying about making like very mundane props to me. I'm just making a wheelbarrow, you know? There's technically nothing exciting about this, but... I'm having fun with creating a wheelbarrow. Right, uh, let's steal... Oh no, what happened here? What is that? Oh my god. Okay, let's pretend that that didn't happen. Mm -mm -mm. Where's one of my wheels? That one is not. I'm gonna take that one. Ninety degrees. 
This is a little bit detailed though. For this size, maybe we should take a simpler one. Uh, those are hollow. This one is really simple. <clears throat> I guess, yeah, it's kind of like the one that we had before, but... Uh, okay. Let's do some tweaks to it first, though. I want to make this... This thing round. We can actually use loop tools for that. Did like a, a weekly blog about that like a couple a couple of weeks ago. One of my favorite tools. So loop tools, circle, bonk, it's a circle. Um, what is happening here? I'm trying to think, do we need... Well, if these holes are going to be that round, then we might as well add Geo to these ones as well. That one. Oh. Yeah, I guess we can do the same thing again. Make sure that we select everything, though. Pum -pum. Circle, there we go. Oh god. The amount of times I did this manually. Oh, for no reason at all, just because I didn't know better. <laughs> all the time's wasted. <laughs> the pain. The pain. Scale it down a little bit. Um, let's have a look at... The wheelbarrow's here. I don't think they have a hole in it, right? Yeah, they're quite solid. Let's see this one. This one's cool. Well, I guess they have that stuff on it sometimes. Yeah, but the smaller ones can be like really simple. I think they even... What is that? That just like a large... A large, like, slit through it. That can actually be quite cool. Maybe we should try something like that. Uh, whatever. You can just be... Wait. Oh, let's make sure that our geometry is uh, cleaned up a bit, though. We've added these additional loops that we don't necessarily need here. A limited dissolve all this. Edges. Ah, oh, clean up the geometry later. Don't want to do that now. Now we have this thing going. Maybe. Oh, we need to. We need to have splits anyway. Me. Wherever there's a red line, that's going to be like the demarcation of like a wooden plank. So I'm currently using that as like a guideline. This. Seam. Have all of this stuff.
Oh, yeah, technically. Yeah, so the long ones, they're going to be for the sides. So this works out. Said so this works out. And then these are going to be like all the end pieces. Like we have the sides here and then these are going to be the ends of the wooden planks, right? So I'm trying to keep the direction of the grain in mind when I'm working with wood. What's I gonna do? What's I gonna do before? Oh yeah, we wanted to do like a, a cool little cutout like the, the one that we see here. This kind of thing that we can barely see. Love it. Beauty is in, in the weird places. Where are we going to steal a wooden plank from? We just take like a normal beam that I have lying around here. Push it. The, oh, maybe... Where is it? These things here, right? Yeah, we could use those. For everything, let's make sure that we... This. What does that actually look like, though? What is that here? Like, it doesn't go through the thing. It, it's supported by it. It's like this is being supported rather than going through it. Kind of like this here. But then it was disconnected. I need to figure out like medieval wheelbarrows. Yeah, this is generally like how how in depth I go with this stuff though. So, mm. yeah, so this is this is more like the stuff we're currently looking at, right? Where it's just like a simple centerpiece that's just like going through the entire thing. A little like here as well. Oh, this one's cool. Oh, that's from Greece. Okay. Hmm. Let's just see what it looks like. We model it. So they have, so the, the wheel itself is split in three parts. So this is, this would be the main part. Uh, right. I'm just trying to determine like how I'm going to split this up in the best way. We select everything by seam. Ah, screw it. We'll, we'll just do it this way. Gonna split this up. We're, uh, we're gonna extrude like a new section out of here. Oh, actually, this is perfect. So, right, and then we'll turn off. Quick face attributes, and then we'll 
to like another section out of here. Let's actually do the same thing here. So that the UVs are already like wrecked on these pieces. And in the middle of it looks like it's a different orientation. So we're basically going to take... Yeah, so we can take this ring, put it down, and then rotate it like 90 degrees. Like sandwiched, like, inside of each other. Okay. Okay. Make it a thicker core as well. You know what? I'm going to keep them separate for now because it might make sense to push like certain parts in if we wanted to. I'm going to, I'm going to keep them. I'm going to combine them into like one mesh. I'll do that. But then we can still push in like individual parts should we wanted to. To create like more depth. And more like a like a more interesting silhouette as well. Then this we snap to vertices. Uh we snap to What does it do? Okay. Good manually then, thanks. Yeah, and then I'm gonna eat this wheel, replace it by this one, which has this sandwich style thing going on. And then we'll sync that up with this before we start doing the cutouts. The thing with the wheel is we wanna. We want to make sure that it's aligned properly, right? So that the center of it is right where we want it to be and its diameter like touches the ground. All right, something like that. Well, cool. let's see. Let's see if we can now boolean some stuff out. I'm probably going to put them into place where I want them to be. First. Let me rotate this. And I'll probably get rid of the holes as well. Like, especially the, the smaller ones. Let's do something like that. Then I'll just duplicate it and like inflate it just a little bit. And that's the mesh that we're going to be using for the bullion. Kind of like we've been doing the entire time, right? Go into here. Let's do a bullion. Not a bevel. Then we're going to Cut those two things out. Apply that. We can get rid of the boolean pieces. Maybe even shrink these a little bit. Don't want to make it too obvious. I'm gonna squish this down a little bit. Okay, now that we have those two connector pieces, let's see if we can get rid of these holes.
Can I can I just do like a limited dissolve? Hmm, that's gonna dissolve okay. here. I'm basically trying to clean this up without changing the UVs too much. Grab the UVs from there, squish it up a little bit. annoying what if I just collapse them all to the center point Basically, just trying to get away with as much as I can here. Stone chains UVs. Yeah, there we go. Last. No. Okay, on this, you change UVs. Okay, whatever. It's good enough. We might have to, like, readjust the UVs anyway. Never mind. Thanks for popping in, George! Was a fun stream to watch. Have a nice weekend, everyone. Yeah, you too, buddy. Alright, I'm just gonna finish all this little wheel and then I'm gonna be popping out as well. I'm going for like four and a half hours. So much for uh, watching me just clean up stuff, basically. Appreciate that. Wait, why is that not the center? What's happening here? Wheel is not centered. So we can actually make use of vertex snapping here. Just say like, hey, look. The location of this one. It's better. So I'm gonna be. I am gonna be real lazy. I am just gonna. Cut this thing in half and do a symmetry because I can't be bothered to like replace the bottom circle. The way that I did it before. Lazy artists are good artists, remember that. There's like a weird pat on the back on that one, but. Like a justification, let's call it that. I'll get rid of that. So these couple of ones need to go as well. Then. Oh, 
just for sake of making it speedier. Just cut those out. Let's do symmetry. Here in this case. Rotation is fucked. We'll do that. Cool. And we'll just have to like re UV these two sections. Oh, what's happening there? Oh, that's because. Oh no. Those are marked with seams. Oh, these things aren't. Let's see. Something going on with the selection here. So, let me. Oh, don't want to do that. I'll just do these two things. Get rid of the stuff that I wanted to get rid. Of. Whatever, man. Whatever. Have a look. I think we got a question in the chat as well. Is it actually okay to create a specific landscape material with the help of tutorials and use the scene with the material for portfolio work? I mean, I'm not tech art, but can't do environments without. Uh, yeah. With the help of tutorials? Yeah, that's how I do it too. For sure. How do you learn it otherwise? Tutorials are totally fine to use, by the way. It's different if you're, uh, the thing with tutorials is the most important thing there is that you understand how it works, right? Because the thing that you don't want to do is proclaim that, you know, uh, a lot about like landscape shaders. And then once they start asking you questions about it, like you're going to fall through the floor, like really quick. Right. But that's the thing you want to avoid that sort of situation. But if, yeah. Using tutorials totally fine. That's how that's how I do all my stuff too. Right? If I don't know something. It's just in the end I feel like I have to mention literally everything I've used while learning. It's not a goal. Oh no, you don't have to. Like only Well, if you're like there are examples, right? Like, uh, if you're creating a military radio based on a military radio tutorial, yeah, mention the tutorial, right? But if if you if you haven't figured out how to do like a material function for like one of your landscape layers, that's part of your, like your bigger landscape material. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to, right? It's just like such a small component from it. Totally fine to use tutorials. I'll let you in on a secret, which not a lot of people know, but people inside this industry also use tutorials. Did you know that? Ah, oh, it's fucked up all of this stuff again. I find it I find it an interesting topic because that that's also a thing that came up uh I think on Twitter where I last read it, where people were really confused that uh professionals also use also use tutorials. It was such a yeah, such an interesting thing that I've never really thought about because of course we do, you know? Yeah, interesting nonetheless.
<laughs> but because I thought uh, I had the question once and I thought I'd be frowned upon watching a tutorial while sitting in a Ubisoft office. The wonders of zero work experience. Well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, we watch tutorials like all the time, right? It, it kind of depends on um, usually the benefit of working in inside of a large studio is that you don't have to watch tutorials because you have experienced team members that have already done the study you're trying to do anyway, so you can just ask them, right? But technically, what you're doing is searching for knowledge that you don't currently have with just another source. The source, in this case, is just YouTube or whatever. And in the industry... Uh, in the industry, like you're, you're just learning from, from your peers, right? Then someone says you're not getting paid to learn, which would be weird. Um, so I think usually when people say that, they mean it as like a, a black and white thing, right? Like they say that if you don't know the subject matter... Like, you're not going to get paid to then learn all of it when you're in the industry, right? Which is true. Like, if you don't have, like, if you don't have the skill set to just do the, the basic stuff on the job, then yeah, you're not going to get hired, right? Because you're literally not getting paid to learn. Um, but it's usually more great than that, right? Like, you're obviously still going to be learning on the job. Um, but yeah. Like those those kind of statements are kind of like weird and outdated, right? Like in any job, it just it doesn't doesn't matter which one, right? Like you're coming in and they usually have like very specific things that you need to do in a very specific way with the software that they have or with the workflows that they have. And with workflows, I mean like it can also be like a very mechanical thing, right? Like with the with the workflows that they use in like a factory, for example. You're still learning. Uh, let's just do this a little bit different so that we can cut out on this one. I guess. Let's do it like that. Because you have that middle edge too, so. Oh, I guess that uh, doesn't matter that much. Maybe instead of just making it like a full square, let's maybe just make it like that. Because we had a geometry anyway coming from like the center. Thanks for answering those questions. We're bugging me for a while. Oh, whenever something is bugging you, like feel free to ask. Like, you know, there's no. I know it's an overused thing, but like there's literally no dumb questions, you know? Like, you don't know what you don't know. No, and the only way that you're going to know is either by like silently hoping that someone else is going to ask it or that you're going to encounter it in like a professional setting. But yeah, I think it's better to just get out ahead of it. So I've been there. I mean, yeah, it's normal. Totally normal. gonna quickly wrap all this let's see how this looks uh let's have a look here i just want to achieve something i didn't try or do very often can't know everything so basically if i get hired by my portfolio works nothing above that is expected and it's okay to learn during the job additionally that's an interesting question uh or like an interesting statement um because, yeah, if you're already getting hired, then, yeah, if you're already getting hired, right, then learning on the job additionally, like, that's perfectly fine. Because they hired you, right? They hire you based on the skills that you're showing and the portfolio that you're showing to them, right? So, they, they kind of know, they know where... Uh, what your skills are and how they can fit you in into the project. You see where the imposter syndrome comes in from, from me at least? Well, yeah, the interesting thing is there with that kind of imposter syndrome, 
is that we, meaning as like you as an individual or me as an individual, like we're really bad at gauging the quality of the level that we're putting or like the, the level of quality that we're putting out with our own work. We are, like like we said before, we're super critical about it. So we always have, um, what is it? Like a lesser idea of ourselves. But what usually happens is that the people that are on the other side of the table that are potentially recruiting you or that are doing the interview, um, they have a completely different idea because they don't have like the same set of uh, experiences or like all the baggage that we have because we know where we come from, right? They just look at like your current skill set, your current output, and if you're already there for like an interview, that means that it piqued their interest, right? So usually, usually if if we're thinking about applying, the reasons why or why not are usually self-determined, which is a wrong way to do because you don't get to make that decision. You should apply anyway and leave that decision in the hands of the people that are going to be doing the hiring, right? And then if, if you applied to like a whole bunch of studios, and there's nothing good that came out of it, then you can take all that data and look at it as in a way of like, okay, maybe I need to do some improvement, right? But it can also be the complete opposite where you fire off like a bunch of portfolio, like a bunch of portfolios to studios that you like, and maybe one responds and you're in, right? That can also happen. You don't, you don't get to decide that. They have to make the decision on that. Like all you can do is put your bed best foot forward and let them do the decision making when it comes to that. And that's why that's why I always recommend like if you're thinking about applying for a job and if it's like uh, a junior job, you know, like let's say let's say you're building up your experience, you want to get a junior job, then don't get scared by like the the one or two year thing, right? Which is usually like a part of like a junior application. Like years don't matter. Like the, the only, I don't know why they put it on there. Like the only good thing that I can think of is that they want to set the bar higher and like scare off the people that are like already scared of applying anyway, right? So that they can cut off like the, the, I don't know, the certain percentage that Things that this is like, oh, you don't need to have like any experience. And this includes like you working for yourself and like improving your portfolio and stuff. I think they just want to cut out that side of things. But yeah, doesn't mean that you shouldn't apply. Just fire it off and then let them make the decision. Let them decide whether you're good enough or not. Because I know we're deviating, right? Um... The thing also there is, is that you might have been good enough. But if you're not, um, well, no, you might have been good enough, but there might have been something else that prohibited them from hiring you. And you most of the time never know about that. Like the only thing that we get to reflect upon is our skill level that we brought to the table, right? But there's usually so many other factors that come into it. Like, what is what is the current mandate, right? Like, what is the current project that they're working on? Do they need new people? Uh, what's the funding of the studio? Do they have senior people to train you? Do they, uh, yeah, is the timing right? Like, is it too early in production to get like a junior person on? Like, there's so many factors there that you generally don't know about that, yeah, you, you all kind of have to factor that in if you can. Wait for the rant. Hi, Corey. How are you doing? <laughs> there are so many things to learn, but an artist can't know everything, so there will be gaps. The fear of being pre uh, prejudiced and accused of lying about skill is big. Oh, but the second part is easy, right? Just don't lie. Like, it, it, I mean, 
it is really that easy, right? If you don't know something, you don't know it. Like, and if that costs you the job, then that also means that you were like not qualified for the job. I know that this is like very rough, but I'm thinking about like my own experiences when, um, let's say five to six years ago, I applied, I applied to uh, playground games. It was for uh, for like a, I think it was a four years position. I don't remember, but they they asked me um, if I knew what like Alpha Overdraw was. I had no idea, not a single clue, you know. And I just said that. And I think I think here comes speculation, right? Because you don't know what happened in the background. I think that cost me the interview. But also, like Alpha Overdraw is so important in like a full use position that I was kind of going in like. Uh, Underskilled anyway, and this is not like an entry position, right? This was like a mid position that I was applying for. So yeah, it's a little little side note there. How do you know just by looking at a portfolio? So yeah, that's a that's a good question. There are a lot of signs where you can tell just by looking at a portfolio that a person hasn't had uh, a couple of skills or not yet, right? Uh, you can just tell by the technical implementation of certain things that they don't know the restrictions from something. Right? Um, I'll give a very stupid example. Uh, one that I can't think of. It's not an actual example, right? But if... If someone says like, hey, I'm making a low poly, but then the low poly is like 200k tries. That's not a low poly, right? They have a fundamental misunderstanding of what they think they're making and they need to just like uh, really look into uh, what they're doing there. So when they misjudged my skill looking at my portfolio, it's not my fault. Um, that one is difficult. I think, I think what you should try to do is, um, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna round this all as well. So. Switch over to the camera. Just do some chatting. Um, I think what you need to try to get out of that conversation is what can you do? How can you take control over the situation? Right? What is what is that there that you can do? Um, if you think they misjudged you, you can't really do anything about that. You know? Um, because that's like your best... I even say it like they might have not not misjudged you right it depends it depends on what you're you're specifically talking about hi Vivek today I'm late <laughs> no worries um maybe okay maybe let's take a step back maybe a better way of looking at it is how do you know if they misjudged your skill right because I'm I'm doing uh, I'm making an assumption here, right? Like that... Wait, let's have a look. Doesn't it depend on the people who hire to know what to look for in the portfolio? Yeah, for sure. But how do you get to that conclusion that they misjudged, that they misjudged your skill on your portfolio? How did you get to that conclusion? I think that's that's an important one to to dive into, right? Because that's where the answer is going to be. But yeah, usually, like, uh, you're absolutely right, right? Like the the people that are looking for um, additional artists to recruit, they usually know what to look for in a portfolio um, because they have. If it's HR, they probably get like a. An overview of the position right um in our case the artist did a lot of recruitment so it was a little bit different there 
But like when I worked at Ubisoft, right? Like that's my only recruitment experience that I have. Being involved with that. Yeah, it definitely depends on the people. They said they didn't expect the speed of work, but this is probably because who hired wasn't really... Yeah, they didn't have like all the knowledge. It looked cool. Hired, but it wasn't enough by far. Um... <laughs> Let's go to the topic. It's an interesting one, though. I, I just don't know. They said they didn't expect the speed of work, but they did. This is probably because who hired wasn't really knowledge. Yeah. Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, you just gotta... Like, the, the main thing that I'm trying to get at, right? Uh, oh... Oh, okay. I thought you were working too quick. Sorry, that was... uh misunderstanding from my part um because that wouldn't be an issue right um i was just too slow for them yeah oh and you mean that as in a way that they misjudged your skill because they assumed that you were going to be quicker than you eventually turned out to be is that correct or hello is alberto i have an interview coming up and I've already made an artist and they like my result. But I'm really nervous about the interview specifically because English is not my first language. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, we're going to close this off with uh, Coffee Diction. Um, but yeah, if you're working too slow, then... Yeah, you can't really judge that on a portfolio, right? Like that's usually, that's usually why we do an artist. Um, so I think, I think you're right. Like the time investment or like how quick you work is probably one of the harder things to judge. The only thing that you can really look at, and sometimes I did this, is how quick you post projects on ArtStation, right? But there's a lot of false positives that can be in that because let's say you have like a bunch of back, backup work and you all post it in like a couple of weeks and it looks like you're churning out work, which isn't the case, right? Um, but no, that, that's something that's something that can ideally ideally be done in an artist or in in questions, right? Like in the interview, where you ask them, like, uh, okay, here's here's a hypothetical brief. How long do you think it would take you to make that? Right. So. Uh, But I can also tell from the other side, playing devil's advocate, right, that in the interviews that I was in, I've never asked a question like that. I think, I think that there is a thing, if you can make really good work, it doesn't really matter how long it takes necessarily. Because you can speed that up relatively quickly, you know? As long as you get like a good artistic insight, obviously it still depends on the company to make that decision whether that's the the risk or not, right? That's that's up to them. Um, and in this case, maybe yeah, they leaned they leaned into being more careful rather than taking a risk. I hope that helps. Yeah, it's a good it's a good conversation topic of addiction. Thank you so much. Uh, let's go back to Lewis then. Uh, I'm really nervous about the interview, specifically because English is not my first language. Don't worry about that. Um, just in short, don't worry about it because uh, it's a very international. It's a very international and culturally mixed uh, group of people that you usually go for. Um, so whenever whenever someone like I've I've been in interviews myself where the the person on the other side, their mother tongue is also not 
uh, English, right? Uh, I myself, I'm also not English, right? Like I'm from Belgium. Like English is my second language, so to say. Um, so that's definitely not going to be, well, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be used as a bias against you. And from what I can tell, the typing is good. So yeah, don't worry about it. You might, you might even be, uh, this, this is something, you might even be surprised with the people that are in the interview and how good their English is sometimes. Because I've worked with people that you can, you can tell that they're not native English speakers, right? I think the most important thing there when it comes to language, to kind of contradict what I was saying before, is that you can at least um convey yourself in a helpful manner to other people right because there needs to be like a basis of professional um what would you say like professional communication right that's the word that i'm looking for that's going to be helpful to work in like a team a team situation so there's definitely going to be some requirement of like just basic english knowledge right um, but yeah, don't let that stress you out. Just be yourself. Um, they're also just people, you know, they've also been through like, uh, the same sort of stuff before. So yeah, be yourself and good luck, Lewis. Thank you so much for the question. And then Sarah Papa. Oh, Matthew is actually adding to this. Yeah, it definitely doesn't matter about your background. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, it shouldn't be. You know, that's the ideal. And I think a lot of companies are doing a really good job at that. Um, Sarah Papa, last question before we round off. Thank you so much for all the good questions, people. Love it. Um, sorry to add another question in the mix so close to the end of the stream. But are there ways to gauge how quick you are, like artist simulations? This is an interesting one. Because they've made mock art tests. So I actually have like a collection of like fake artists that we sometimes do for Beyond Extent. Um, but it's been ages since we used them. So. I'm trying to think if they're like an effective way of testing your skill. Or like your, your speed, right? Um... They could be. Yeah, I'm trying to think. What what would be the best way to test your to test your speed? I don't really have a good answer for that. Like probably like the the best thing is like art test simulations, like you're saying, right? Where you get a brief, you have to execute it within like a certain amount of time, and then see how far you get to kind of test what is expected from you. Um. Another one could be where you do a bit of freelance work, right? But that's already like a bigger step than like testing it in like a vacuum um, to get like a real life experience before you step into like a big, uh, a big studio. I mean, if that's interesting to you, Sarah Papa, just um, reach out to me on Discord, and then maybe. Maybe it would be interesting to possibly revive these 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 fake artists. Still have the briefs lying around anyway, so might be interesting. Let me know. Let me know what you think about that. But I don't think, yeah. I guess without artists, what you could do is say, hey, um I'm quite comfortable in making an asset, right? How, how quickly can I make one? Like, what's the quickest way? And maybe maybe try it in a weekend, right? Like, try, try like a relatively simple prop. And let's say you give yourself like the weekend, let's say eight hours a day, and see how far you get. Oh, yeah, yeah, 100%. Confidiction, that's a great point. Start from a concept. Don't. Don't do any designing. Like, you just want to be focusing on the thing that you're responsible for in the industry, right? Which is just, like, executing a concept and making it into 3D. 
So yeah. Piggy concept or a real-life object. Uh, hint, hint. The solo challenges could be a good one for this, you know? If we have to plug that anyway. Um, we got a new one coming up anyway. Like in, uh, what is it, tomorrow? We should have one coming up. Yeah, should have one coming up. And then kind of use that as like a benchmark, right? Or like a training ground to just be like, okay, how quick can I do this? Right? And see how far you get. Uh, and, and pick the simplest thing, right? Don't go for something complex in the beginning. <laughs> Lexi Wuno, hello. Welcome to the chat. Happy to have you here. English is not my first language either. I understand when someone is talking or it's a text, but when I need to talk in English, it's hard for me. But yeah, be yourself. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I think with that, I'm going to pop out. This was freaking awesome. I appreciate like all the questions. I, I'm i kind of surprised that so many people were here when I was ju just doing barely any modeling and like polishing. So I appreciate it. Thank you so much for all the questions. Uh, go check out beyondextent.com. You know, I'll, uh, I'll plug the website. I'll add it in the chat as well. Um, we have we have a bunch of resources to become like a better environment artist. Uh, and maybe even consider joining the community. You know, appreciate the support and it helps us going. Or even just subscribing. You know, there's a lot too. Anyway, ramble on. Or like ramble off. And... Yeah, have a nice one, everybody. And I'll see you next. When do we see you next? Oh, we have we have like a, a, a stream coming up on Sunday with, with Lloyd, who's going to be presenting the end of the team challenges. So that could be interesting. Or else I'll just be here next week. I'll see you then. Bye-bye.